The next item of business is debate on motion 14914 in the name of Miles Briggs on new approach needed to tackle Scotland's drugs crisis. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Miles Briggs to speak to and move the motion for up to nine minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Ten years ago, pressure from the Scottish Conservatives resulted in the then First Minister, Alex Salmond, committing the minority SNP government at the time to develop a 10-year drugs recovery strategy. At the time, Scottish Conservative leader Annabel Goldie rightly called for a new focus on rehabilitation services and action to address the shocking death rate amongst drug-dependent Scots. In 2007, this saw the unacceptable situation in our country where 455 of our fellow Scots died as a direct result of drug-related deaths. A decade on, and we need to see and be totally honest with what has gone on, the SNP government have failed to lead that change that we all wanted to see. And the road to recovery strategy has not just... Yeah, very briefly. Neil Finlay. Given that his party had such an influence on that policy, is it the influence of his party that has caused the numbers to die uh, to double? Miles Briggs. No, no, I think in terms of Mr Finlay, his contribution to these debates, he should maybe consider the issue we're talking about and the fact that we're trying to progress this policy, which is exactly what Scottish Conservatives MSP did. I remember at the time Labour, what was left of Labour, who have returned to this chamber, did nothing on this issue. So we'll take no lectures on this today. The Scottish Government's draft strategy estimates that there's 61,500 people in Scotland between the ages of 15 and 64 who are engaged in problematic drug use in Scotland today. That has significantly increased from the estimated 52,000 Scots who needed help uh, at the, during the uh, road to recovery strategy in 2007. Deputy Presiding Officer, a decade ago, Scottish Conservatives asked SNP ministers to act. Today, we are demanding SNP ministers take action. Scotland is face facing a national public health emergency with record number of drug-related deaths. Last year, 934 of our fellow Scots, uh, in a second, last year alone, 934 of our fellow Scots died as a direct result of overdoses, more than double the number a decade ago and two and a half times the rate UK-wide. Yep. Stuart McMillan. Thanks for taking the intervention and I refer members to my register of interests. Uh, but as Mills Briggs now saying, that his party and him did not agree with road to recovery. Miles Briggs. That is that exactly what I'm not saying. What I'm saying is what we hoped would be a strategy this government would deliver to turn this around has failed. Ministers have failed, and today we're resetting them to make sure this is a challenge this whole parliament takes up to address. Yeah. Presiding officer, Scotland is looking to its parliament and to this government to act, and we need action now. The human cost is immense. Drugs wreck families, destroy lives, and are holding back some of our poorest communities. The financial cost is just as severe. It's been estimated that drug misuse costs Scotland £3.5 billion every year. So Scottish Conservatives are today calling for a new approach and have consistently called on the Scottish Government to tackle and take a genuine cross-portfolio approach to drug addiction in Scotland. That is why this week we've set out our own radical proposals on how we believe we as a country can reduce drug addiction and cut drug-related deaths. We want to see steps taken to establish innovative new approaches in Scotland to support individuals, families and our communities. The establishment of local commissions for individuals caught for the first time in possession of drugs. An independent review of the methadone programme. A redesign of alcohol and drug services. A redirection of funds into rehabilitation, recovery and abstinence support. More prison-based interventions, followed by transitional and long-term support for addicts. Increased peer support, employability and education programmes, and a third sector recovery a task force. We're also calling on the SNP government to actually commit to some real targets to benchmark drug policy, something not included in the last strategy. Targets we believe are achievable with a change in direction from this government. A target to half the number of drug deaths in five years and a target to increase the number of problem drug users accessing treatment not from just 40 percent to 60 percent listening to those who work day in day out in our drug and alcohol partnerships it's clear that they feel let down by the scottish government and that the scottish government's drug and alcohol strategy is simply not fit for purpose i want to make some progress in the time having taken two scottish conservatives agree with them 
Many feel the Scottish Government is lacking the real vision to get a grip of the crisis facing our country that is costing lives, destroying families and affecting so many of our communities. This is too big and too important an issue simply to be left to this SNP Government. Today the SNP Government have decided to publish their drug and alcohol strategy on the very day we are debating the issues in this chamber. From reading the strategy, my initial thoughts are that it's not developed the actions the sector have been calling for and is not going to make the real long-term difference that we all want to see. Like the positive steps taken to improve the suicide strategy, Scottish Conservatives have offered to work with the Scottish Government on this issue. I met with the Minister in his very first day in the job and outlined how we wanted to see a radical new approach, something which has not materialised. This Government has not prioritised the public health emergency which we have in Scotland today and have not looked towards the long-term solutions which we all should work to develop. Most recently, the SNP government has destabilised the sector with a £20 million cut to funding for drug and alcohol partnerships. The third sector is simply not being let in and has been given the opportunity to set up the help and support for drug addicts and their families and our communities and provide the additional infrastructure the country so desperately and clearly needs. The situation in Scotland today is at crisis point. But there are also warnings coming internationally. The opioid crisis which we're seeing in the States is a major warning and a call to action for all parliamentarians across this chamber. A year ago, Alison Johnson and I visited uh, the Al Edinburgh Alcohol and Drug Partnership Facility and met with a number of service users there. It's a visit which will stick with me uh, for the rest of my time in this parliament. And we met with an individual there who had spent 20 years in drug alcohol services. She had felt like she was being moved around these services and wasn't being given the opportunity to escape what was a cycle of decline, she saw it. She told us her own personal story about the fact when she was growing up at six years old, uh, she had been abused by her father. At 13, she'd been in introduced to actually uh, heroin by her father and how that had destroyed her life. What struck with me was actually how she felt it was her fault somehow. But what she really wanted to say and what I want to say today is the opportunity to get into recovery services just did not exist here in Edinburgh for her and doesn't exist across Scotland and that has to change. The current strategy and the government's new strategy does very little to achieve that. And I do not want to be standing here in 10 years time taking part in a debate on how to address the thousands of drug deaths we will see in Scotland. Deputy Presiding Officer, it should be a national scandal that under the SNP, Scotland has become Europe's drug death capital. Over the last 20 years of devolution, Scotland's failed to make any real progress in addressing the drug dependency and drug misuse facing many of our fellow Scots today. We as parliamentarians can decide to spend our time blaming other parliaments. We can look for excuses or policy areas which we do not have within our powers today. Or we can act. We on these benches are not willing to see this national public health emergency continue. We need action to set our country, our health services, the third sector, our local communities, the challenge to help turn this situation around. We can come together, we can work together to develop a new national approach which is needed to clearly tackle the public health emergency so many of our fellow Scots are facing today. But we need this SNP government to understand that it needs a radical new approach to tackle this crisis. The Scottish government can and must lead that change or make ways for others to do that. I move the motion in my name. I call Joe Fitzpatrick to speak to and move amendment S5M 14914.2 for eight minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. I'll, I'll move the amendment in my name in case I forget later. Minister, Minister, could you the, pull your microphone over oh, a wee sorry. bit? Yes. Very sorry. Also, the last 10 years have seen significant changes in the nature of Scotland's alcohol and drugs problems. We have witnessed a significant increase in the number of drug-related deaths and corresponding high levels of alcohol-related deaths. Alongside that loss of life, problem substance use also inflicts pain, trauma and suffering on individuals, families and communities right across the country. I came into this post at a time when there was already work underway to develop a new substance use strategy. However, I took the decision at that point to pause what was being produced, allowing me the time to meet with people from the sector, those who are responsible for commissioning and delivering our treatment services, but also with some of those who have used them and still use them and their families. 
Just this morning, I announced the publication of our new combined alcohol and drug strategy, Rights, Respect and Recovery, at the Cairns Centre in Dundee. I had the opportunity there to meet the service users who spoke to me about their experiences, including their, substance, their, their use of substances, but also their stories of recovery. I also support, spoke to many, mem many family members, and I was able to speak to some of the staff who work there to get a feeling for what it's like to be at the front line of service delivery. I was also very pleased to be able to take a very short training course, which allowed me to be trained to um, dispense naloxone. It took, I think, maybe five minutes. So I really encourage anyone who hasn't done that to, to get in touch with one of the services. This is one of the ground leading things that we, we do here in Scotland. We, we internationally lead on this. It saves lives and we can all be part of that. And it took literally five minutes to get the training. So um, thank, thanks to um, the staff who, who gave me that training this morning. So in the development of the strategy, I was very keen to speak to as many different groups and individuals as possible to ensure that I understood where the differing points of views uh, come from, but also to understand what the reasons behind those views were. In addition, we also undertook an engagement progress, pro process around the document and received over 140 responses. And what I've learned during this is that the field of substance use is not one that is easy to navigate and that there are opposing views on a number of points. However, the conversations I've had and the feedback received so far, I feel that what we've published today is a strategy which has the support of the whole sector. And I've certainly looked at the feedback so far today, and that would certainly seem to be the case, overwhelming support for a, a strategy. We all want to see the reduction in, in the levels of harm associated with alcohol and drug use, and our new strategy sets out how we propose to achieve this. Importantly, the strategy recognises the significant increase in drug-related deaths and the corresponding high levels of alcohol-related deaths and sets out a range of options that will work to reduce them. We know that being engaged with services has a protective factor and that this is one of the most effective ways of keeping people alive. Yep. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful for the Minister giving way. Does he accept that his government's cut of 23% to alcohol drug uh, partnerships between 2015 and 2017 will have played some role in our uh, poor performance in terms of drug mortality statistics? And does he recognise the loss in institutional memory from organisations that folded or lost staff in that time? And that's going to be very hard to, to recoup. No, no, I, no, I don't, I don't recognise the, 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 the figures. Um, that was not what happened. There was a different way in, in terms of funding. Um, and what I do recognise is the £20 million extra funding that we have put into services. But our strategy sets, sets out how we um, will improve the reach, attractiveness and speed of delivery of treatment services. We'll also deliver and maintain the best possible treatment and recovery services which we can respond to, to the changing patterns of substance use and associated harms in Scotland. I need to make some progress, I'm sorry. The strategy also describes how we'll utilise the new investment of £20 million per annum, which I just talked about, for the lifetime of this Parliament, to put health and person-centred services at the heart of our approach. It also covers um, how we'll work in partnership with stakeholders, service providers and those with lived and living experience. With the partners, um, we will agree a new memorandum of understanding to deliver an agreed strategic outcome uh, to, to deliver on the, the agreed strategic outcomes contained within the strategy, but also to guide our new investment. There is also um, a challenge contained within the strategy for our treatment services, asking them to consider how they can adapt to ensure that they can find those individuals who are most in need of help and support and which can deliver services which address their specific circumstances. The strategy... Indeed. Neil Finlay. Listening to all that the Minister has to say, within all of what he's said so far, what does he say to my constituent who came to see me last week who wants treatment for heroin addiction and has been told that there's a three, four, three to four month wait to see anyone? Joe Fitzpatrick. I know that, that, that waiting times are, are certainly improving across Scotland, but, but that's exactly what this strategy is about. This strategy is about how we provide those services to people and, and do it better. 
This strategy also recognises that some of the approaches that we are currently in use do not go far enough in terms of harm reduction and it confirms our support for health-focused, evidence-based approaches such as safer drug consumption facilities. And we'll continue to press the UK Government on this matter, working alongside our colleagues from Glasgow Health and Social Care Partnership in an effort to progress this, knowing that the introduction of such facilities could save lives. We also set out the benefits of investing in family inclusive practice and support, recognising that taking a whole family approach can also bring huge benefits for all involved. And I know the families that I spoke to this morning really appreciated that approach. A strategy also recognises the importance of language and the significant impact that stigma can have on the individuals, but also their families and loved ones. This is one of, one of the things that over the period since I came to office that I've, I've, I now understand much more than others, the, the real impact that stigma has on being a block to people going and getting the treatment that they need. So we've committed, we've committed to using the language around substance use that's set out in the Global Commission on Drug Policy publications from earlier this year. And we'd encourage others to do likewise because some of the language that we've seen around this is just plainly offensive. Yes. It's your last minute, Minister, so quickly. Thank, Jenny Thank the Minister for giving way. He announced his £20 million for ADPs this morning. He'll know as well as I do that the ADP in Tayside has been underspent for the last two years. So does he recognise that there are more intrinsic problems with ADPs rather than just cash? Joe Fitzpatrick. I, I, I think the member makes a very good point, um, and, and that's why this, this strategy is not just about how ADPs deliver, but how this is delivered in a much more holistic approach. We've got some fantastic third sector organisations, such as the, um, the Cairns Centre that I visited this morning, such as our amazing 120 recovery groups right across Scotland who are just doing fantastic work. Um, so we've got a reputation in Scotland for being world leaders on taking action to prevent uh, future harm from implementing um, alcohol, alcohol minimum unit pricing and May to our support for safer consumption facilities. We've had cross-party support for alcohol pricing measures and so we call on consensus on preventing and tackling drug harm too. I understand that the motions and amendments um, were drafted before rights recovery uh, rights respect and recovery was published this morning but i hope having now seen the published document members across the chamber will feel able to get behind the strategy which has very much been finalized in collaboration with a wide range of stakeholders this is an area which requires us all to work together going beyond traditional party lines as we as we seek to improve the health of some of the most vulnerable members of society I call Monica Lennon to speak to and move amendment S5M 14914.3. Seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This debate is crucial because Scotland is um, experiencing an alcohol and drugs-related public health emergency. Um, on that, Miles Briggs is not wrong, and we're, we're pleased he secured this debate. Um, and we do recognise that across the chamber there are passionate and strong views. In the 10 years since the previous drug and alcohol strategies were published, there have been over 15,000 substance-related deaths. And for context, 15,000 is the equivalent of the entire population of Lark Hall, one of the towns that I represent. So if we continue at this rate, in 10 years' time, the population equivalent of another small town will have been wiped out too. So that is a state of emergency, and that's what the amendment in my name seeks recognition of. This is my first opportunity in the Chamber to congratulate Joe Fitzpatrick on his ministerial appointment. And I do believe him to be sincere in tackling the issues outlined in it. And I very much welcome his comments uh, on, on stigma and language. But I'm sure the entire health team who are here uh, from the government today would, would agree that, um, you know, they can't have the luxury of, of a honeymoon period because people's lives are at risk today, tomorrow and the next day. There were 934 drug-related deaths and 1,235 alcohol-related deaths last year alone. So that's 2,169 preventable deaths in just one year. 
Today, we agree that, that we can support the wording in, in the Tory motion and the Scottish Government's amendment. And in doing so, we're going to knock out our own amendment because we do want to find consensus. It's not about cheap points in this chamber. But we don't agree with all of the proposals on the table and some of the, the rhetoric that we've heard today. If the government does declare this alcohol and drugs public health emergency uh, or declares it an emergency as public health crisis and puts the full force of all of government behind this, it will have the full support of our benches. And whilst we can support the wording of the Tory motion, I have to say we don't support the strategy released to coincide with today's debate. The strategy, which does say some decent things, uh, I fear is, is dangerous in other parts and it appears to be shaped by Tory ideology rather than evidence-based solutions. Today's debate is a topic close to my heart. Yes, happy to. Miles Briggs. I thank the member for the intervention and for letting me uh, take in this intervention. When will the Labour Party be putting forward their ideas? Because we've heard nothing from them. They don't seem to have any ideas. And as we've seen today, the government's just published their strategy ahead of this debate. Monica Lennon. <laughs> Don't dare, Miles Briggs. If you are really genuine about this, you don't rush out a strategy on a few bits of paper to get ahead of the government and bounce them into a strategy. In, your, in, in Miles Briggs' strategy, he talks about the financial costs of the drugs crisis. What about the financial cost of austerity? There is no mention of that, and the word poverty does not feature. So the strategy from Miles Briggs isn't worth the paper it's written on. But if I can continue, presiding officer, because we are passionate in this, and I know Miles Briggs is too, but following my members' debate on the alcohol and drugs-related deaths last year, people across Scotland got in touch with me, and I'm sure they got in touch with other members, to share their own family story of the, the devastation that alcohol and drug harm causes. And it's crucial to countless families across Scotland that we do get this right. And I don't think we should come to this chamber today and have to react to different statements because we've heard some fantastic contributions from, from all of the stakeholders across Scotland. And I think in Scotland, there are some things that we're leading the rest of the world on. And I want to pay tribute, and I'm sure Miles Briggs does too, to Alcohol Focus Scotland, to SHAP, to the Scottish Drugs Forum, Scottish Families Against, uh, Affected by Drugs and Alcohol. And it's their input and their evidence that has helped Mr Fitzpatrick improve the strategy that he started off with, and hopefully members across the chamber too. But today is not a day for cheap points, because a lot of us know from family experience and through supporting constituents that the human stories behind alcohol and drug harms are always complex, often chaotic and invariably tragic. One issue that we on these benches have with the Tory strategy is that it fails to recognise that people experiencing addiction are in the grip of an illness. We're talking about illness. So there are some positive policies in there, but I fear that we have a strategy which reinforces the stigma around drug harm. And if we're going to have uh, policies around, you know, try to arrest and uh, punish people to get them out of recovery, and you're going to feel the full force of the law if you don't cooperate. That, well, that's the kind of a rhetoric that's coming across. And I would say to Miles Briggs that that is not helpful. In contrast, and I don't often agree and support the Scottish Government, but a rights-based approach is the correct one. And a stated commitment to the right to health does have the potential to make a real difference to people's lives. Other colleagues, Alex Cole Hamilton, Jenny Mara, have made the point that alcohol and drug partnerships must be properly resourced. And I don't agree that the government has always played fair on that. A lot of it's to do with funding, but there are issues around how resources are spent and the transparency around that. And I'm sure others will make those points. We do agree that a new approach is required. When 15,000 people have died during the course of the previous strategies, we all have to be brutally honest and say that it's not just a refresh that is required. This is a public health emergency and the Scottish Government should declare that for the good of the country. It's imperative also that I believe the Scottish Government does commit to targets to focus and reduce alcohol and drug harm. Preventative action harm reduction and reducing health inequalities will be key to tackling this issue meaningfully and effectively. Now, death is not the only indicator or measure of alcohol and drug harm. There are over 60,000 problematic drug users in Scotland. 
I know it's difficult to identify the true number of problematic alcohol users. There were over 36,000 alcohol-related hospital admissions last year alone. Specialist medical responses are urgently required for alcohol-specific illnesses such as fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and alcohol-related brain damage. And I would ask the Minister, as it looks likely our amendment will fall today, if, if he supports the asks in, in our amendment. The treatment of alcohol and drug misuse must include recognition of the social and economic root causes, and that's where the Tory strategy fails. Addiction doesn't discriminate and it can affect all walks of life, but it's deprived communities that are more likely to be impacted by drug and alcohol uh, harm. Um, I wanted to speak on stigma. I was pleased that the Minister mentioned that. So in conclusion, Presiding Officer, we do support the Scottish Government's amendment. Um, I'm disappointed that our um, amendment is likely to, to fall today. So I'll finish with a question which I think gets to the crux of the matter. Does the Minister agree that this alcohol and drug related crisis is an emergency? Will the Scottish Government delay, declare a public health emergency and work with all of us for the goods of the people of Scotland? I move the amendment in my name. I call Alison Johnson. Six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, like all members, I regret that we're discussing an 8% increase in drug-related deaths since last year. And we've heard already that another 934 people have lost their lives, at least in part due to drug use. And when we debated the need for safe injection facilities earlier this year, Parliament agreed they should be implemented in Glasgow and called on the UK government to make the necessary changes to allow that. It is frustrating that this Parliament doesn't have the powers to authorise much needed public health facilities in its own right. And I know some members will want to discuss the scope for heroin assisted treatment and I am interested in that. But the fact remains that in Scotland we have long agreed to treat addiction as the public health issue it undoubtedly is. And if UK legislation doesn't reflect this, then the relevant powers should be devolved. I thought that that earlier debate showed our collective commitment as a parliament to prioritise the safety of drug users and also help prevent addiction. Daniel Johnston in that debate stressed that there is a failure in trying to criminalise individuals. That is fundamentally flawed logic. And Neil Finlay suggested we should be looking to Portugal, where possession and consumption of all illicit substances has been decriminalised since 2001. And I felt encouraged by Brian Whittle's honesty when he told us that his own views on a safe injection facility in Glasgow were no longer black and white. He took the opportunity to ask people at Ad Action in Kilmarnock what they thought about safe drug consumption facilities and found they were interested in what results might come from facilities in Glasgow. Uh, certainly. Brian Whittle. Can, can I thank the, the member uh, uh, for taking the intervention and also say that prior to today's debate, I also spoke to Ada Action again yesterday on a specific topic. I think my issue around this is, is and I wonder if you would agree, there are many, many levers available to the Scottish Government currently that they have in their own, they, they have the, completely in their own remit. Why are we focusing on the one thing that isn't within their remit? Alice Johnson. I think it's absolutely clear in this debate today and even from the Minister's contribution that we're not focusing on this one thing. This is a holistic strategy. If we want to help people who are suffering from drug addiction, we have to be looking, as Monica Lennon has so rightly said, at welfare, at employment. You know, there, there's a lot involved in this issue and I don't think we're just focusing on that one thing. But I did think there was a real will to get people help, to get people who inject help within safe facilities because when they attend these facilities, they're more likely to get the help and the support that they need. And with that, I think there is a consensus that we should be investing more in prevention. The motion and amendments to the debate today focus on the government's strategy, the draft strategy, though I note, as other members have mentioned, that the final version of the strategy has been published today. But the timing of the debate, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't um, cloud our discussion of the issues at hand. I think the government's draft strategy fell very short and in my quick reading of the final strategy so far, it's clear there is much work to do if we're to deliver real change. I certainly agree though with the emphasis the government's motion places on the principles of right, recovery and respect. We do need strategies with public health at their heart and which don't stigmatise people. 
um, briefly. Miles Briggs. Tony, in terms of the, um, the visit we did together in terms of residential places, Edinburgh only has 12. There's nothing in this strategy which is going to make sure that we really realise the potential of far more so people can get into recovery. So is that not something we all need to focus on and the government need to think again on? Alison Johnson. Um, absolutely. There's a need for more residential places, and I think that point was well made at our visit. This is something that we should insist upon. Um, the cross-party group on alcohol and drugs, too, have raised they raised real misgivings about the draft strategy because it said very little about how it will reduce fatal drug overdoses. And this can't be acceptable when drug-related deaths in Scotland are so high. And I recognise that the final strategy highlights the particular risk of overdose for prisoners in remand, but all deaths from overdose must be seen as preventable. They are all tragedies. And I was shocked to find that compared with a decade ago, there's been more than a 200% increase in drug-related deaths amongst women. And we know that there's also a cohort of long-term drug users who are ageing, who now have multiple complex health needs uh, to contend with, as well as addiction, and they often feel written off. So we have to make sure that the drug strategy includes all who suffer through drugs. I would like to press the Minister for an update on two particular matters. On the government's timeframe to appoint a childhood bereavement coordinator to improve support for children who have lost parents, and on the government's timeframe for establishing a national commission to oversee the implementation of safe injecting facilities. And many of the concerns I had about the draft strategy, its lack of focus on reducing bloodborne virus transmission, for example, are simply not reflected in Conservative proposals. We have made a commitment in Scotland to eliminate hepatitis C by 2030, and the final drug and alcohol strategy does at least support that ambition and intends to make hepatitis treatment in the community a part of future addiction services. Safe injecting facilities will also play a key role in reducing the risk of death from overdose and in reducing bloodborne virus transmission. The Conservatives' recommendations would introduce a new public awareness campaign to prevent drug use. I'm sure that is well intended. It does have a place, but evidence suggests that mass media public information campaigns aren't an effective way of influencing this kind of behaviour. And it would also be helpful if Conservative members could expand, as the debate goes on, on the extent to which its approach to recovery encourages abstinence, since abstinence will not work for everybody. The Scottish Drugs Forum state that abstinence is a state or a condition, not an end in itself. It need not be the measure of success for services or the goal of treatment. In closing, presiding officer, I believe there is scope for improvement in the government's final drugs and al alcohol strategy, but I welcome the focus on rights, respect and recovery and will be supporting the government's amendment today. Thank you. Alex Cole Hamilton, six minutes, please. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm very grateful uh, to the Conservatives for bringing this important motion to the Parliament this afternoon. Uh, this is a public health crisis. There is no two ways of saying that. And um, as such, you know, we, the, the measure of our policy response, our public policy response, is the measure against which everyone in this chamber will ultimately be uh, judged in this agenda. And it's fair to say that 10 years after Road to Recovery was first adopted, I, I'm grateful to the Conservatives of um, articulating their involvement in that. We can see where that worked and where it's failed and where we need to build from that going forward. But I think it's also fair to say that in recent times, this Scottish government's public policy response to this public health crisis has been wholly inadequate. We see that in the 23% cut to alcohol and drugs partnerships, which I'm not overstating things, Deputy Presiding Officer, can be measured out in human lives. That all told resulted in a 1.3 million cut to drug services per year in our nation's capital and with it untold death and suffering alongside. That is two, more than two to one of what the rate is in England and has led to an HIV outbreak in, in, uh, in Glasgow which is still not abated since it started in 2015 as well. It's not just about money that services depend on but with that loss of money came a loss of certainty. Many services lost staff, unsure if their contracts would be renewed. And as such, the institutional memory of organizations that have been working valiantly in this field for so very long uh, just frittered away. And it, we will struggle to get that organizational memory back. We've heard a number of contributions, excellent contributions from people like Monica Lennon and Alison Johnson today talking about the 
inexorable link between drugs use and a whole range of poor social outcomes, whether that's poverty, housing and employment. And let's also remember that housing is absolutely vital at the end game when we've helped stabilise chaotic substance uses, that many people who leave drug treatment facilities or are leaving prison often go back into communities where peer groups led to the chaotic behaviours to begin with. So we need to ha have a whole systems approach in terms of our response on a public policy level. Now, you all know that my background was in children's rights and uh, children's services. And certainly children affected in this area are often uh, an afterthought. And I, I was dismayed to, to not see more about that in the, the draft strategy from the government. And whether that is in uh, looking to getting our priorities right, which was the practice guidance, not refreshed since 2013 mm -hmm. in terms of how we as primary care workers or social workers respond to the needs of Scotland's community of children who are affected by problematic parental substance use. In the freedom of information request that the Scottish Liberal Democrats revealed this week that says that 600 babies have been born since 2015 with chronic fetal alcohol spectrum uh, syndrome, which means, sorry, uh, fetal abstinence syndrome, which means that they are born addicted to substances. I cannot think of a worse start to life yet. This is happening in Scotland in 2018, and our response to this so far has been inadequate. I think also that stems to our not failure to fully grapple and understand the needs of adverse childhood experiences. And I once again ask government to heed the call of Harry Burns in terms of capturing ACEs. I'm glad to see some of that in the strategy today. But it's very easy for me as an opposition politician to poke ho holes in a strategy. So let me suggest some empirical, practical solutions. Firstly, I want to see a ministerial commitment, and I hope we'll get this in his closing remarks today, that this Scottish government will endeavour to protect forevermore those vital ADP budgets so that drug services in our community and alcohol services in our community have the surety of continuing government funding so that they can recruit and retain staff and build relationships at the heart of the communities where this is most needed. We need to recognise, and I welcome that government has finally moved this from being a justice issue to a public health issue, and as such, I ask them to go one further, convert that recognition, and stop sending people to jail for possession. Instead, we should be sending them into treatment or education. Given that, in places like HMP Adiwell, 50% of those tested on release were still tested positive for drugs. We are not... I will. Tom Arthur. I just wonder if you would support calls for the devolution of powers over drugs to this parliament. Alex Cole-Hamilton. I believe, I believe that our response to this has to be a whole island response. I don't think this is, these problems are situated entirely in Scotland. They have to be a, a solution right across the board. But I do believe that where we have sentencing power, we should not be sentencing people for low-level possession for the reasons I've just described. I, I must make progress. Um, I also want to understand an, uh, an explanation from the Scottish Government as to why drug treatment and testing orders, which the strategy itself says have benefic beneficial impact on both drugs addiction and indeed offending behaviour, were only used 31 times last year, despite 4.4 thousand uh, convictions for drugs possessions. Similarly, I want to see Scotland-wide proposals for heroin-assisted treatment, something again we've heard uh, more of today, but I want to close my remarks, presiding officer, by focusing on the impact of children. We need to do more for those children affected by parental substance use because life can be cyclical. People can pick up learned behaviours because of the trauma they experience as a re result of chaotic parental substance use. And that means capturing adverse childhood experiences as former Chief Medical Officer Harry Burns has asked us to do. I'll finish with a quote I saw on a local treatment centre wall and uh, it really struck me as, as why we need to take this debate. It says, tomorrow is the most important thing in life. It comes to us at midnight very clean. It's perfect when it arrives and it puts itself in our hands. It hopes we've learned something from yesterday. And I think that there are thousands of people in this, in this country who are looking to this chamber for help to stabilize the situations in which they find themselves. We do, it all, uh, do them all a, an injustice if we don't heed that call. Thank you. We now move to the open debate and contributions of up to six minutes, please. Liam Kerr, followed by Joan McAlpine. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to support Miles Briggs' motion today and to support the Scottish Conservative strategy to reduce drug deaths and addiction. Presiding Officer, we need new thinking and we need fresh thinking. Miles Briggs has set out some of the stark realities of the present situation. Let me 
add to those statistics. Nearly 1,000 Scots died last year due to overdoses. And that's almost double what it was 10 years ago, and it's two and a half times the UK rate. Scotland is on track to record more than 1,000 drug deaths this year for the first time. It's the worst drug death rate in Europe. And there's been an increase of nearly 10,000 problematic users of drugs like heroin, methadone and sedatives in the last 11 years since the SNP launched their failed strategy in 2007. Now what that tells me is that when Professor McKegany described the SNP's so-called road to recovery program as disastrous, creating a financial black hole and an addiction industry, he was right. Now we have the same tired thinking from the SNP plan today. We've had David Little, director of the Scottish Drugs Forum, say the draft strategy's most serious deficiency was its clear or lack of clear measurable targets, exposing a total lack of vision. The strategy still has no targets. Yes, of course. Joel Fitzpatrick. I wonder if the members heard David Little's comments on the strategy. So David Little today said, we welcome the fact that that reducing the number of preventable overdoses, overdose deaths is the key focus of the strategy. There are key elements of the strategy that will help us respond to this public health crisis. And he goes on um, in, in, in positive terms on the, on, on the strategy. On, 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 on the alternative, Roy Robertson, Professor of Addiction Medicine at Edinburgh University, said that the, the strategy proposal were, were uh, published yesterday were based on little evidence and contained some rather strange ideas. He added, I don't know what this paper has to offer and what it means in terms of the plans the government has placed, but it is disruptive, poorly thought out and retrogressive in its approach. Liam Kerr. Thank the Minister for the speech. Um, what Roy Robertson also said was that the SNP's strategy was inadequate and watered down. And David Liddell said, there are no targets. There are still no targets. The minister cannot divert from his own failures by selectively quoting the likes of Roy Robertson, I'm afraid. President officer, drugs are a blight on our communities. They destroy lives and break up families. Our plan identifies ways to achieve what we all hope for. Fewer people addicted to drugs, fewer deaths, fewer lives destroyed. We're talking about drug abusers for whom better outcomes are achieved by addressing the root cause of criminal behavior rather than letting it spiral out of control into continued drug use and reoffending. The Scottish Conservative strategy sets out our plan to deal with first time drug offenders to ensure their first time is also their last. First time drug offenders would be given a choice, a criminal record or referral to a local commission with powers to prescribe treatment. This intervention would be kept on record and would be seen as an aggravating factor if the individual were to reoffend. But it would mean that a criminal record could be avoided in the first instance. Presiding officer, will I have time at the end? Sorry, I think you may, but only for one. <laughs> uh, Claire Hockey. Claire Hockey. I, I, I thank you, uh, Mr. Kerr, for, for taking an intervention. Does he not accept that addiction is an illness? Yeah. Is that the question? Liam Kerr. Uh, I, think the, uh, I do thank the member for the intervention. I think certainly in some uh, circumstances, yes, absolutely, addiction can be an illness. Absolutely. Uh, that's another matter for another debate, what circumstances but, uh, or an intervention, but I have no time. But look, I, I don't quite understand why the member is attacking on this. I, I think it's a, a reasonable point. Um, and the point we are trying to put forward in the strategy Ms. Hawkey. is that we need Ms. Hawkey. to Thank take you. a new approach. We need to take a bold approach and we need to take an innovative approach. And that is why prosecution will remain as a fallback option if the offender doesn't keep within the boundaries set by the local commission. Uh, this is a powerful incentive to comply with the contract terms and ensure personal responsibility. But look, a similar system is already in operation in other parts of the UK where, for instance, people avoid prosecution if they sign a four-month contract requiring no reoffending, community work, restorative justice, and work with a navigator. Now, those schemes are proven to significantly reduce reoffending. They improve police relationships with drug users so there's better intelligence on the dealers. They reduce the risk of falling into a life of crime. They reduce risk, and most importantly, they save lives. And the second key strand to pick up on is that those who are put in the jail must not be forgotten about. 
Within the prison environment, there is an opportunity to engage with people, many of whom do not engage with the healthcare system due to chaotic lifestyles. The prison environment is a unique opportunity for getting individuals clean. And that starts with mandatory dried spot blood testing on admission to help identify drug users and the delivery of hep C treatment and drug rehabilitation services. No, I have no time. However... Point of order. Presiding officer, standing orders make clear that it's incumbent upon members to consider the language they use in this chamber. The word clean is offensive and derogatory. The more appropriate word is absent or person who has stopped using drugs. Can the, prime, can the presiding officer give her opinion on that matter? That's not a point of order, Mr. Arthur. Please carry on, Mr. Kerr. Governors, governors have spoken about their frustrations of prisoners making real progress, and that's stopping once they leave. So services must not cut off upon release, and instead they should be followed by transitional support and treatment in the community. Under our life plan, an individual's care would be transferred to their local GP, who would oversee progress, access services, and ensure that the prisoner's progress was maintained. Presiding officer, this is a bold and innovative strategy. And it is necessary because 11 years of SNP government have failed to find a solution. Instead, as the motion states, their strategy is not fit for purpose. We have to try something different. A new approach is needed to tackle this crisis. And the question today is whether the SNP will put the health and well-being of the people of Scotland first by voting for the Scottish Conservative motion or continue with the same party politicking and attempts to make stupid points of order. Uh, that has failed the people time and again. We shall see at decision time. Can I say to you, Mr Kerr, it is for the presiding officer to decide on points of order, not for any member sitting in the chamber chairs. Thank you, Mr Kerr. Uh, I now call Joan McAlpin to be followed by Neil Finlay. Can I start by welcoming the government's new combined alcohol and drug strategy and can I welcome the Minister's very proactive approach to this topic and indeed welcome him uh, to his position. Uh, I have a number of things that uh, I would like to say however about the Conservative strategy because it is a Conservative debate and I'd like to start by quoting from uh, an expert's response to the Conservative paper. Dr Hannah Graham, Senior Lecturer in Criminology at Stirling University and an expert in this field some, made some really interesting comments earlier this week. Uh, she started off quite positive. She said the Scottish Tories' new drug policy has benevolent intentions. What it doesn't have enough of are details and commitments on what, how and who and what targets will be met and it isn't costed. Dr Graham's critique suggests that the Tories treat this matter too much as a criminal justice issue as opposed to a health and human rights issue. Yes. Miles Briggs. We have outlined two key targets to half drug deaths yeah. in five years. The government's strategy, her government's strategy published today, contains nothing. Yeah. That's a target. We need it for our country. Yeah, well John McAlpine. Well, <laughs> far be it for me to, do to, to contradict Dr Graham. Dr Graham's an expert in this field and I am quoting what she said about the Tory paper and she's clearly not very impressed with it because... To quote her again, she points out that the, the Tories are the only Scottish political party to oppose plans for a drug consumption room in Glasgow, which we all know would re re reduce uh, the number of drug deaths caused by the HIV uh, increase, which we have heard about already. And if I can quote Dr Graham again, the Tories say drug users being caught for a second time should be seen as an aggravating factor and they would feel, quote, the full force of the law. She asks, is this just two strikes and you're out? drugs policy. We can't arrest or punish our way out of Scotland's high rate of drug deaths, says Dr Graham, nor the scale of drug use. First and foremost, these are health and welfare, not criminal justice issues. And that's what the government strategy is all about. She goes on to talk about the, the rate of deaths amongst people over 35 in Scotland. And she points out that the Tories do acknowledge that, but that contradicts the aim of their policy in targeting first time drug users. And it's the deaths of these older people that I want to talk about in the rest of my speech today because official figures show that the biggest cohort for drug-related deaths is among those aged 35 to 54. 
Someone aged 40 now who dies either because of problematic drug use or illness associated with many years of problematic drug use would have been, in, would have been aged 20 in 1998, a year before this parliament was created. So this is not simply a problem of the last 10 years. It has much deeper roots. It was during the Conservative governments of Margaret Thatcher and John Major that Scotland experienced a wave of heroin abuse which devastated many of our urban areas and which we're still living with today in these high death rates. I, I, I agree that Miles Briggs was only 10. No, I want to make progress. When Irvin Welsh's book Train Spotting was published in 1993, but the Tories ought to acknowledge that their party policies created that train spotting generation. No, I've already taken intervention from you. One in five people out of the total Scottish workforce. This is important. One in five people of the total Scottish workforce lost their jobs in the years 1981 to 83. And by 1985, Scottish unemployment has reached 400,000 for the first time since the 1930s. I want to make progress. We know that there's a direct link between adverse childhood experience and drug and alcohol use and that generation of children and young people experienced adversity on a colossal scale. The pressure of worklessness on families was appalling but also the hopelessness in being told that their communities were not valid and their futures had been written off and research carried out by Glasgow University and NH Scotland only last year found that drug related deaths were linked to these social and economic changes in the 1980s. Other studies by the Glasgow Centre of Population Health reached similar conclusions about the higher rates of deaths in that city. And we're, as I said already, we're experiencing the terrible legacy of that Westminster rule back in the 1980s and 1990s. Scotland has made enormous progress in this area as a result of the progressive policies pursued in this parliament. But we cannot, we cannot write off that area, uh, that, that, that historical legacy that we have. Um, the new strategy launched today is uh, a completely different direction from what the Tories, uh, the punitive actions that the Tories are suggesting. Uh, in, we have already seen improvements. It's encouraging, for example, that recent drug deaths report uh, fewer deaths on, in the under 25s and highlight following heroin, following heroin use, particularly amongst under 25s. And our more progressive health and human rights based approach recognises that deprivation, poverty, trauma and adverse childhood experiences can cause people to turn to both alcohol and drugs. Treatment can no longer just be clinical, but must also address some of the deep-rooted social and economic circumstances that people face. So I welcome the government's strategy of treating people and all their complex needs, not just the addiction. And it's also correct that we tackle the inequalities and traumas behind substance misuse, something that the Tories are responsible for, not just in terms of their policies in the 1980s and 90s, but in the kind of social inequality that has been caused by many of their policies, particularly their welfare policies today. Thank you. Neil Finlay, followed by Michelle Ballantyne. Mm -hmm. Officer, there's, there, there's times when debates in this chamber really depress me, and today is one of them. I was hoping that today we would come to some agreement, a consensus, uh, a consensus on one thing uh, that should be obvious to anyone who shows even a cursory interest in the issues of drug policy. And that, that is that the war on drugs has failed and has failed disastrously. Because like the years of alcohol prohibition in the US, years of prohibition of drugs in this country has been an abject failure, leaving an unregulated product controlled by criminal networks reaching into every community, making illicit drugs one of the world's most lucrative commodities. The impact on communities, in particular the poorest communities like the one that I live in, has been heartbreaking. Drug, drug use is synonymous with organised and violent crime, people trafficking, early death, social isolation, mental ill health, with a consequential impact on the NHS, public services and the justice system, not to mention the impact on the well-being of individuals and families. People are the collateral damage of a 50-year war on illegal drugs, a war that has cost 100 billion a year. And despite this, despite all of this global money, we still see 200 to 250 million users across the world, many exploited, many criminalized for their addiction. And the failure of this approach is at its starkest and 
most devastating here in Scotland. We now have over a thousand deaths a year. The streets are awash with cannabis and cocaine. Heroin can be bought in every community and spice is the drug of choice in our prisons. I recently visited Adiwell Prison to discuss the spice problem. I visited local drug and alcohol projects. I've spoken to drug users who are desperate for help but unable to get it because of excessive waiting time, certainly. John Scott. I thank Neil Finlay for taking an intervention. Would you agree with me that it's absolutely shocking that 90% of the people who present themselves at Bow House as a, for HM Majesty's Government's pleasure to be kept there, 90% of those people present with drug problems on arrival. Don't you agree that something should be done about that? Absolutely. Neil Finlay. And the last place they should be, be, should be in, and is in prison, which more of them will be if we take the Tory approach. So John Scott's right, but he needs to speak to his colleagues to take a different approach. Because I spoke to someone recently who told me they learned a lot in prison. They learned how to steal and defraud. They learned how to take different drugs. They learned how to steal cars. The last place they should have been is in prison for a health problem like addiction. I've spoken to people who are sitting waiting months to try and see a first appointment because they have a heroin addiction. People who have been decades in addiction. They can have as many conversations as they want with their doc GP about getting more methadone, but they can't have a conversation about how they got off illicit drugs and how they got off methadone. And let me say this, I am not a methadone critic. It has its place, but many people want to be drug free and methadone free. I've met families of people who've taken their own lives because they can't get the mental health support they need. I've spoken to police officers on the front line and academics and pressure groups working with drug users. And you know this, at every one of these meetings I ask them what we need to do, not one, not one of these experts, these police officers, these prison officers, health workers or drug users that I've met have said, let's continue with the current strategy because you know what? The war on words is so jolly well successful because it isn't, it's a disaster. We have a public health emergency on our hands. The evidence is staring up from us, staring up at us from 1,000 mortuary slabs. Policy is failing and its consequences are deadly. And it depresses me, depresses me, that an intelligent and decent man like Tom Arthur reduces this debate to a constitutional wrangle. It is pathetic. And I'll tell you why it's pathetic. Because I care as much for drug addicts and people using drugs dying in Manchester or Newcastle or London or Dover or Cardiff than I do here. That's No, I won't. No, I won't. And I, I hear Joan McAlpine depicting the train spotting generation. I've got news for you. Do you know what a drug user looks like? Have a look at the person around you, the person next to you. It isn't the dishevelled, train-spotting image that we have. It's people in your family, in your community. It's constituents who come to see you. It's friends and relatives. That's who they are. John McAlpine. Well, I, I would point out that that's not actually what I said, but surely you must agree with me that there is a legacy of the 80s and 90s uh, in terms of the, the social and economic impact, which, uh, which is what Glasgow University and other researchers have said, and that's why we've got high rates of deaths amongst older drug users. I'm sure that's a reasonable point to make, and I hope he agrees with me. Yes, I agree with some of that. But let's Excuse not me, Mr Finlay. Neil Finlay. Thank you. Let's not depict all drug users like that. In fact, that's a minority because the, the average drug user, if you speak to any of the academics, will tell you it's people like you and I, it's people in our families, it's people in our communities. So we should not have any exceptionalism on that. We see higher levels of infection here, mental ill health, homelessness, crime, more drugs available on the streets and ulti ultimately more deaths. I say it often, but if this was flu or measles or meningitis, we would have a national emergency on our hands, but I suppose there just ain't any votes in addiction. We must learn from other countries. We must learn from the Portuguese model of decriminalization and harm reduction, the Canadian experience with cannabis, diversionary alternatives that are being brought in now with the powers they have by progressive labor, police and crime commissioners in England who are establishing schemes to divert people away from prison and addiction, not at the moment, who are offering a scheme making offenders sign a contract and undergo mental health treatment and sort out their lifestyle. 
They're joining up police and community and public health and, uh, streams to uh, improve outcomes from those suffering from addiction, who are prescribing heroin in a medical setting for those who have not responded to other forms of treatment, who are training people in naloxone, who are establishing early warning uh, programmes to, to alert close, people please. of new drugs on the street and a whole range of other issues. I have to say, timidity and political cowardice will not work. Neither will cutting drug and alcohol bu budgets. And I have to ask this final question. If one cow dies from foot and mouth, we see a national emergency declared. Here we see a thousand of our fellow citizens dying and nothing much changes. This parliament is failing, and, and uh, failing our people. And they will, we will continue to fail it until we see a very significant change in policy. And the, and the uh, strategy published and the Tory strategy simply doesn't cut it. <coughs> OK, um, I've given leeway to each group for their first speaker. Have to be a bit stricter in timings now, so absolutely no more than six-minute contributions. Michelle Ballantyne, followed by Fulton McGregor. Thank you, presiding officer. I have to say, I, I thought this was going to be consensual, and I, I, I actually feel quite emotional about it all now. Um, I was the head of a drug and alcohol service, and I have dealt with the people who suffer and the people who die. And I think we need to tone this down, and I think we ought to be talking together about this, not fighting about it. It just isn't the way forward. Changing the course of Scotland's relationship with alcohol and drugs has quite rightly been on the Scottish Government's agenda since they came to power. And 11 years ago, in my professional capacity, before any involvement in politics, I gave evidence as the head of a drug and alcohol service to the Scottish Futures Forum's project on alcohol and drugs. My colleagues and I left that meeting with high hopes that we had a government that was listening and were genuinely going to tackle the causes through a programme of early intervention and supported treatment and harm reduction. In 2008, the report Approaches to Alcohol and Drugs in Scotland, A Question of Architecture, was published. Alex Ferguson was the presiding officer at the time, and in his foreword he wrote, I hope that politicians, policymakers and practitioners will reflect on the project's findings and also on the systematic approach it has developed. I hope too that every discussion and debate, both at Holyrood and elsewhere for the foreseeable future, will reflect back on the considerable learning to have come from this project. In the spirit of those words, I did look back to that piece of work and reflect on my own experiences and thoughts on how we have come to a situation that far from tackling the problem, we've seen it get worse. Although interestingly, a small survey at the time showed that MSP's confidence that it would improve was significantly higher than organisations on the ground, and maybe that should tell us something. The 2008 report described itself as a systems mapping approach to how Scotland would reduce the damage to its population uh, through drugs and alcohol by halving it by 2025. Frank Pagnatelli, who chaired the project board, summed up the work with these words. The forum has come to believe that significantly reducing the damage caused by alcohol and drug misuse is possible if we reappraise the architecture of our alcohol and drug policies for the long term. To do this, there will need to be strong leadership, honest debate, and sophisticated and flexible policy approaches, all of which must be underpinned by a strong evidence base, sustained investment, and continuous monitoring and evaluation. Well, 10 years have slipped by, and to be honest, I'm not convinced that the government has systematically used this work that was undertaken to achieve that reduction. Organisations in the field will absolutely recognise the new strategy that the government has put out because it does contain many of the things asked for in 2008. But it does fundamentally fail to recognise the need for a whole systems mapping approach. And Frank Pecatelli highlighted why that was important because he said... Interventions to reduce the damage caused by alcohol and drugs, regardless of how well-intentioned, will have intended and unintended consequences somewhere else in the system. By using a systems mapping approach, we have been able to see those consequences more clearly. I really don't think I'm going to have time, but I'll have to talk later. This is important because I know that delivering services on the ground consistently and effectively is difficult and frustrating when government policy doesn't always support what you know needs doing. 
but you're bound to be supportive because your funding is dependent on meeting the policy of the day. That is not the way to run services. Scotland has a complex relationship with alcohol and drugs. We have been world leaders at time on some of the issues, and on some of the issues we still are, and, and I always supported minimum alcohol pricing. It's a good thing in my view. But today, of course, is World AIDS Day, and it should be remembered that treatment in Scotland has been, had been largely drug-free until the arrival of HIV in Scotland. The McClellan Report of 1986 led to the reappraisal of services. Needle exchange, methadone substitute prescribing, and harm reduction approaches were all advocated as a result of that. And by 1994, these were accepted forms of treatment. 1994. We're in 2018 now. We aren't actually reviewing them for modern life. The road to recovery hasn't delivered everything we'd hoped for, despite, I have to say, some excellent work on the front line and some real positive changes in various areas. But as we move towards 2020, we must have an eye to what effective treatment actually means. I believe that an effective treatment for, say, heroin should be a drug-free discharge within 12 weeks of entering treatment and no return to treatment within 12 months. But sadly, methadone hasn't been used in this way. And using it to reduce harm over long periods has a knock-on effect for families. And I want to quote something that the author Stephen King said, because for me this sums it up, and I think it'll sum up some of what has been said today in, in anger. There's a phrase, he said, the elephant in the living room, which purports to describe what it's like living with a drug addict, an alcoholic, an abuser. People outside such relationships will sometimes ask, how could you let it go on for so many years? Didn't you see the elephant in the living room? And it's so hard for anyone living in a more normal situation to understand the answer that comes closest to the truth. I'm sorry, but it was there when I moved in. I didn't know it was an elephant. I thought it was part of the furniture. There comes an aha moment for some folks, the lucky ones, when they suddenly recognize the difference. Parliament, it's time we recognize the difference. It isn't right that anybody lives with it. And it is the children that suffer when they grow up in homes where drug use and alcohol use is normalised because that becomes their way of dealing with stress when they grow up and they become the future problem users and we have to save Please them. Close. So we have to address our drug and alcohol policy going forward. Fulton McGregor, followed by Annie Wales. Thank you, President Officer. And I want to start by firstly acknowledging um, Michelle Ballantyne's fairly um, consensual input to this debate, unlike her, the other Tory speakers in the debate so far. And I do want to start by addressing the inadequacies and glaring omissions from the Tory motion. Maybe it's brass neck or maybe it's naivety, but to bring forward a motion on drug use and not even reference poverty is not living in the same world as the rest of us do. Just last week, the special EU rapporteur on extreme poverty and human rights gave a damning report on the Tory welfare reform in his interim report. Welfare reforms that have plunged 600,000 more children into poverty. And as Bruce Crawford put it in the chamber yesterday, it's the biggest failure in public policy of this century. No, I won't have time, Mr Briggs. Yet, no mention of it. To them, it's just a game. Now, presiding officer, I'm, a, I'm as alarmed as anyone to learn that Scotland has the highest drug death rate in Europe. And there have been an increased misuse of opiates and benzodiazepines in the last decade. This distressing rise in drug deaths is part of a larger trend that's seen across the UK and Europe and is driven by a number of factors, chiefly poverty, as I've said, and a demographic of people who are using drugs, eh, partly as a product of 1980s Tory Britain policy, whose health has become more vulnerable as they become older. And I think that was explained very articulately by Joanne Mc um, Joan McAlpine. Unfortunately, my constituency has, with others, no, I don't have time, with others taking the brunt of the austerity measures. I've got some important points to make, colleagues. The food bank has run out of supplies. The school uniform services met unprecedented demand. Folk are coming in their droves about universal credit. So colleagues won't be surprised to hear that drug use in my constituency is also a major concern. Nearly every other day, constituents tell me of concerns they have for vulnerable people within their communities. And often the local paper runs stories to highlight these concerns. But it's important to remember that drug and alcohol use are not choices. They are symptoms of wider social issues. And I'm proud that in this parliament, we regard it as a health issue and not a justice one. 
We now recognise that factors such as poverty, trauma and adverse childhood experiences can lead people to use drugs and alcohol. I'm sorry, uh, Ms Lennon. We must continue to find new ways to address this issue that are person-centred and evidence-based. Over the past decade, emerging evidence has changed our understanding of the roots causes of addiction and substance misuse. And more work needs to be done with people moving in and out of treatment. And for those who do not access treatment, not all services are meeting the complex health and social care needs of those who, who need it most. And we must say that reasons for falling in and out of treatment are complex, but can include the unpredictable state of drug use, bad experiences with services or punitive measures enforced in patients resulting in discharge. A strategy to address this must challenge services to adapt these complex health and social care needs. And, President Officer, funding does need to be in place. And I think it was a point that was raised by Alex Cole Hamilton. And I always think it's a great pity that one of the first pieces of work I picked up following my election in 2016 was the impending closure of a well established drug and alcohol service next door to the offices where I was moving into. Their funding had run out and they were not able to get any more from the Council or the Health Board. And although patients were offered another service, I later found that this transition was not seamless. And remember, we are indeed talking about some of the most vulnerable people. And more broadly, the government and health boards need to work together to address localised health inequalities. For example, a few weeks ago, I, along with others here in the chamber, including Alex Neil, um, spoke in the debate in the Monklands Hospital. Surely the days of having consultations simply on the location of a new hospital are long gone. These consultations need to address wider health concerns and inequalities. And if there's any consideration to taking a hospital with an A&E &E away from the centre of one of the most deprived areas of the country, where people present with alcohol and drug-induced emergencies, then it is incumbent on boards to suggest ways to address these, such as using the current site. And I do welcome the review set out by the Cabinet Secretary and hope they'll be addressed through that. Presiding officer, I warmly welcome the strategy announced today and outlined in the Government Amendment. My own experience as a social worker tells me it's the right approach to take. Um, the rights to respect and recovery is a bold way to address treatment. This strategy aims to help uh, people by working collaboratively across sectors and addressing the root causes, as I mentioned earlier. It takes an innovative and person-centred approach and seeks to divert users out of the criminal justice system where appropriate and tackle wider issues such as housing, employment and mental health. The strategy also includes support for families and loved ones, allowing them to be closely involved in treatment and it emphasises early intervention for young people most at risk of becoming addicted. Presiding officer, I want to briefly mention Reach Advocacy, based in my constituency of Coatbridge and Chryson. Reach are a charity made up of people with lived experience, um, direct or indirect, of addiction and work to support recovery for individuals, carers and communities affected by problematic drug use and mental health conditions. They are the only rights-based charity advocacy service of its kind in the country and as such are in a fantastic place to take forward the direction intimated in the Scottish Government's draft drug and alcohol strategy. Reach have worked with the government policy team to encourage a human rights-based approach to taking addiction into recognising the life course of individuals living with addiction and dual diagnosis and to help develop a model in which advocacy is a significant and relevant. REACH have been asked to apply for both the Challenge Fund and the National Develop Project Fund, which cover both the advocacy service and the SQA accredited training centre in delivering the approved advocacy practice award. And I'm disappointed to hear that this amazing organisation are struggling to continue because of much needed funding gaps in the local landscape. They are asking not to be treated unfairly because North Lanarkshire does not have an obvious and identifiable ADP board and, and uh, we engage with in order to obtain partnership working uh, while talks are ongoing. And I would back these up and ask the Minister in the summing up if he would consider taking this up directly with Reach. Presiding officer, to conclude this is a no, major public health concern now, and we all must do a bit to work together with it. Thank you. We're going to have to be a bit stricter in times from now on, or people will be getting their time cut. And I call Annie Wells to be followed by Tom Arthur. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am pleased to have the opportunity to speak in this debate today and to have contributed to the Scottish Conservative Addiction Strategy. When looking at how we tackle Scotland's long-standing legacy of drug and alcohol misuse, it's clear the efforts of the Scottish Government in the last 10 years have failed. We need a new approach. Growing up and still living in one of the most deprived areas of Glasgow, I've seen firsthand what drug addiction can do, not only to the individual, but also their family, friends and neighbours. Drugs and alcohol devastate too many lives and it's time for real change. Last year in Scotland, we saw record numbers of drug-related deaths, 
We've already heard the, the figure was 934 people who died in 2017, a rate double that of 2007 and two and a half times higher than the UK average. As I've said in the past, the fact that we have reached this crisis point is evidence of the long-term failings of Scotland's drug policy. What the Scottish Conservatives are proposing today is a whole life strategy, one that focuses on understanding addiction and providing, providing meaningful opportunities for people to be drugs-free altogether. Uh, actually, I'll take a very brief one. Stuart McMillan. I thank Annie Wells for taking the intervention. Uh, just after what she just said there, does she then uh, actually still agree with the use of the language of problem drug user in the proposal from the Scottish Conservatives? Annie Wells. I think it is a problem in some circumstances because not a, there's drug users out there, and I know many of them, and I can look about and I can see the devastation that takes place in Glasgow. We have reached this crisis point today because of a failing drug policy. And what this debate is so important that we have it today to make sure that we come together as a parliament to debate something that is so important. Yep. I don't want to see more, more people dead, dead through drugs this time next year and standing here debating this again. As a starting point, the strategy commits to reviewing all deaths by drugs. As we've seen by the statistics, Scotland's drug-related death rate is two and a half times higher than the UK average. And to truly understand the issue and how best to support people with addictions, we have to understand the following. What makes, what makes Scotland so unique in its relationship with drugs? Who are the groups most at risk? And where is it in the system these people are being failed? By understanding the journeys of those who have sadly passed away, we can put in place effective strategies that capture people on the journey to addiction rather than waiting until the point which, at which they have reached crisis. Prevention too is key, making the ask once get help approach so important. It's right that first time offenders are given a second chance and by giving the choice between a criminal record and treatment through a local commission, this approach recognises that drug use can be the symptom of deeper underlying issues. When I visited Turning Point in Glasgow and spoke to service users there about their own personal journeys, many linked their addiction to adverse childhood experiences such as abuse or family breakdown. And to give an example of a woman who is now in her 30s that I spoke to, she explained to me that she, she suffered abuse as a youngster. And this was the starting point that led her to eventually taking heroin. However, she was never offered the support she so badly needed in the early years of drug abuse. This is why we are proposing a strong public awareness campaign that builds greater public understanding of the links between mental health problems and substance misuse. It's also so important that we look at radical new ways of doing, doing this, looking at the potential for anonymous e-mental health apps and targeting of key demographics and key media. Again, as I have said in previous debates, the focus should always be first and foremost in getting people off drugs altogether with the belief that virtually every problem drug user in Scotland can be supported back into a functioning lifestyle, that should be the right support to be given. Currently, people are falling through the net of a system that's not working. And as we've heard last year, the alcohol and drug partnership budget were, was cut by 23%. And we are seeing people parked in methadone indefinitely, despite this drug being implicated in almost half of the drug deaths last year. We want to see greater focus on promoting smaller abstinence-based local treatments, which will help drug users become drug-free. We want to see a dramatic expansion of support for third sector. I don't actually have time, I'm sorry. We want to see a dramatic expansion of support for the third sector so that it has a direct fund to help, to help establish places for rehabilitation. I met with the director of the River Garden Oak and Crove project in Ayrshire, which opened this year, and was really inspired by what the project was trying to achieve. Based on a residential setting, the programme offered free accommodation for those who volunteered and the opportunity for employment within the village shop, cafe and bakery. It's this kind of whole lifestyle approach that can make a real difference. And we don't want to park people on methadone. Of course, it will always have a role to play, but we desperately need a full independent review of the drugs use. And at the moment, we don't have a full picture on how often patients are being reviewed and exactly how many people are on methadone prescriptions, something that needs to change.
To finish today, any life that is lost to drugs is absolutely tragic, especially for the family and friends closest to those who have lost their lives as a result of drug abuse. For too long, a number of measures that have been, been seen to be tried and tested have failed those for who a number of reasons turn to drugs. It is time for a radical new approach that fits with the challenges of this day and age, and I believe these benches have laid out many such policies today. Tom Arthur, followed by Jenny Mara. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, in beginning, uh, let me just acknowledge a point that Michelle Ballantyne made at the opening of her remark when she said we should be talking, not fighting. I want to associate myself with that remark because it is far too important a topic for it to descend into political point scoring. If none of us in our own families personally, we will have friends and relatives who have been affected directly um, as a result of the challenges we face around problematic use of drugs. It's an incredibly difficult subject, and I understand that emotions are, are, are running high, um, but I, I, do, I would wish to just address a couple of points that um, arose. Um, Neil Finlay accused me of seeking to play constitutional politics. I presume this was in reference to an intervention I made on Alec Cole Hamilton. Alec Cole Hamilton was, was speaking with regard to the misuse of drugs powers. Now, I know Alec Cole Hamilton is a committed federalist as a member of the Liberal Democrats, and there are many countries which have a federal constitution where there is different drugs powers in different parts of the overall state. It, it, it varies in different countries, it varies the amount of powers, but it was a genuine inquiry for information. Alec Cole Hampton set out his point, and I, from a sedentary position, acknowledged that and respected it. The reason it's a relevant issue for Scotland is, of course, the Scottish Government has called for powers and for conversations so that we can further and progress opening a safe consumption facility in Glasgow, certainly. Excuse me, uh, I was so enthralled that I didn't notice Alec Cole Hamilton standing up. Alex Cole Hamilton. I, I'm very grateful to the member for giving way. One of the reasons I uh, hold that position of believing in a whole UK solution to drugs issues is that we are making progress, finally, slowly, uh, with the Westminster government on the Misuse of Drugs Act, particularly around the prescribing of cannabis therapies. Uh, will the member tell me if he supports the Liberal Democrat call for a regulated cannabis market in the United Kingdom? I can't give extra time for interventions, so be wary of the length. No, Tom I'm, I'm very grateful for Alex Cole Hampton for intervention. I am looking on keenly at the examples internationally for that has been occurred. But I think fundamentally all of our policy decisions have to be evidence-led, and I think we have to be open-minded and considered all options. But fundamentally it can't be driven by all ideology. It has to be led by evidence. The other point I wanted to pick up was um, in my exchange via a point of order with Liam Kerr. I know Mr Kerr is a, a considered and thoughtful politician and I appreciate he got angry, but I, I wanted to raise the issue around the use of language because we are all in a journey when it comes to language and we can all slip into terms that are perhaps outdated and unbeknown to us can cause offence. Now, the simple point I make is that the, the word, the term that Liam Kerr used, which we have all, I assume, used at different points in our life, is clean, but the corollary of that is someone who is using drugs is, is unclean and this is a, a particular issue for, for me personally because since being elected I have uh, spent a lot of time working with the Hepatitis C Trust and other stakeholders within that wider community and I've had the privilege of meeting clinicians, third sector workers, academics and many others but the most powerful experiences I have had are meeting people who have had Hepatitis C and have been cured of it due to the fantastic new treatments that are available and in all of these encounters and conversations I have had, what people who have had hepatitis C have said to me is that it made them feel dirty. And that had a, a stigmatizing effect. And for many, a, an effect more stigmatizing than has perhaps historically been associated with HIV AIDS. And that sense of feeling dirty, is, to use the word that you used to me, acted as a barrier to progressing their own lives in many other areas. So I think it's very important, and I'm not going to seek to chastise anyone for language. I think that collectively have a, a responsibility to, 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 to raise our game um, when it comes to language, and it's going to be a journey for all of us. I want to pick up in my final couple of minutes in, in what I think the fundamental issue is, certainly. Liam Kerr. I, I genuinely thank the member for taking the intervention. I think it's a very reasonable point he's making, and I, I just want to apologise for what was slightly intemperate language. I just didn't feel it was a point of order, but I do accept the point he's making. It's a good point. Tom Arthur. 
I accept that and I recognise it perhaps wasn't a, a legitimate point of order. Um, the final point I would want to just make is, is, is around the broader issue of prevention. Um, I, th I think it's, it's inextricable the links between poverty and adverse childhood experiences and how they can relate to people as, as young people and later in life starting to use drugs. And I think that's something that we have to be incredibly cognizant of. And so when we look at that whole, uh, whole cross-cutting portfolio approach, we have to think about the, the broader suite of powers that we have and how we tackle poverty and social injustice. But in concluding, I think there's a key message and that's education. And uh, the conservative document, which I, I, I have read, and while I, I don't agree with all of it, and I think there's, think there's things that could be improved, I, I do welcome a, a policy contribution in seeking to engage in debate. I think that's, that's to be very welcome. But there was reference made to a new public awareness campaign to prevent drugs use. And just one aspect is it would seek to highlight the dangers of drugs. Now, that is a, a mode and a, and a method of communication that has been used historically. There was reference made to the war on drugs, and people of a certain generation may remember Nancy Reagan and just say no. But one of the, uh, the evidence that we have actually is campaigns which seek to stimulate fear are actually quite ineffective. What the best approach, and this is something that's set out in the rights, respect and recovery strategy that the government has published today, is it's actually about empowering young people and all people to make positive health decisions. Not scaring them, but giving the information so that they can make these health no, decisions. No, Mr. It's just closing. I thank you, President Officer. I conclude there. Thank you, Mr. Arthur. I now call Jenny Mara to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The, the Chamber will allow me to, um, understandably, I think, address my comments to the uh, situation in Dundee at the moment and try and draw some conclusions from there because the Minister and I both have in common that we have a very personal interest in um, this human tragedy at the moment. Him and I went to school in Dundee roughly around the same time, and I lost um, ch uh, kids that were in my year at school and I know that he will have two as a result of this crisis in our city and across the country. There was a report by Sarah Smith on BBC Scotland last night that said that um, Dundee had the highest uh, drugs deaths rate in Europe. We must be really careful when, when we're talking about these figures because they, all, they always have a context, presiding officer. We know that drugs deaths are higher in deprived communities and Dundee City Council has a very tight boundary around uh, those deprived communities and the Drugs Commission that was set up last year in Dundee is doing some very good work at the moment in putting some of this into a wider context which I think will have lessons for, for the whole country. I want to start with the human face of this. I was talking to a woman in Dundee recently who told me that she felt her daughter was safer in prison than she was um, at home in Dundee and this was repeated again on the BBC report last night and I think that kind of story really brings home some of the insecurity um, around this whole issue. I'd like to address a few points in this debate. I want to start with the point about the ageing cohort. I've always felt that this is really quite a misleading statement. And I feel when government ministers are on TV talking about the ageing cohort, the image that appears as somebody is about to get their bus pass and has perhaps been taking drugs for 40 years, in fact, the age we're talking about is much younger. And I believe the average age of those who die from drugs is 41. That's exactly the age I am now. And in no other sphere, presiding officer, would that 41-year-old be considered old. So I think we need to look wider than that. It's a very, um, it's a very uh, simple explanation. I think we need to look at harm reduction. And I think the minister would say that we, we haven't been as strong as that in all governments over the years, but there's also a big question of toxicology here. And this is a problem that's quite pertinent to Dundee in terms of the streets being flooded uh, with um, as cheap as 20 uh, pence uh, blue tabs of Valium that in a combination with heroin are causing a, a, a large spike in death. So I think that the, I, I would like to see us stepping back a little bit from the ageing cohort, because in no other sphere would we say that we shouldn't be looking at harm reduction and evidence-based solutions for 41-year-old people who are dying. Now, 
I've touched on the Dr Dundee Drugs Commission. The Commission um, is doing some excellent local work and I think that local work, presiding officer, is particularly important as we need to understand individual circumstances before we can really put in treatment for them. Now, I did a whole series of meetings around this before the Commission launched earlier this year and I saw a huge disconnect, and I know the Minister will be aware of this too, between the stories on the ground and a very defensive account from the NHS drug services. And I understand now in the Commission that doctors feel that they're being asked difficult questions by the Commission. But I feel that that is right. I feel the Dundee Commission is doing some really good work here. And um, it will, when it, when it reports in May, I hope it will actually provide a bit of a blueprint or a bit of a pathway for, for other places across the country uh, to look at and come up with their own local solutions. Presiding officer, I want to touch on this. I think it's really important. Alcohol and drugs partnerships. The minister today has announced 20 million more for ADPs. I mentioned in an intervention to him that we've actually in Tayside underspent 381,000 in 16 and 242, nearly a quarter of a million pounds last year. So this ju isn't just a cash problem. I think there's a huge question here about what ADPs are actually doing. Because page 30 of the new strategy published this morning says that the Scottish Government will support ADPs to evaluate current psychological interventions. But in Tayside, over the last few years, we know that very little evaluation has been done by the ADPs. And there has been, no sorry, there's been no implementation of countless recommendations over the years. So can we answer this question? How do drugs workers and doctors on the ground know what they are trying to achieve when we have the ADP, we have the, the community uh, partnerships, we have the strategic planning groups, we have the IJBs, who all have a locus in drug services and are really just a rearrangement of chairs of NHS and council officials. And all of them together work under about 15 different frameworks at the last count. That's multiple strategies which are really not useful. I say this to the minister in my concluding remarks. I think the level of debate this afternoon has been quite poor considering what we're used to in this chamber. And I believe that is because of the complexity of this issue. I don't think any of us in this chamber have the real answers to the questions that this motion poses today. And I would like to say that my colleagues on the Labour benches would be very happy to set aside everything that has gone before and work with the government on a cross-party basis and with the Conservatives and other parties. Because this is a huge crisis in Scotland. It is killing young people. I don't believe the Conservatives come from a bad or a terrible place on this. I think we all have people's welfare come at heart course, and we need to solve this. And I make that offer, a very sincere offer to the Minister today and I hope we can move forward. Thank you. John Mason, followed by Emma Harper. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I, to pick up uh, one of Jenny Mara's last points, this is an area of great complexity, and I do not think there are any easy answers to the challenges of the alcohol and drug abuse and dependence that we face. If there were, presumably we or others would have found them already. It seems to me that there is both a health and a justice angle to all of this, but I am very happy to agree that we should place more emphasis on drugs being a health problem without losing sight of the disruption to the lives of those impacted around the edges. I frequently have complaints from constituents whose lives are made a misery by dealing going on in their closes, with purchasers arriving at all hours of the day and night, going to the wrong door, eh, and I have older people especially living in fear in their flats. And I've gone into closes myself, including in, in some quite nice blocks of flats where you find needles and other paraphernalia on the landing. So some residents are looking for evictions and enforcement of the law. In my own constituency, we have a particular problem in the Calton area. I visited a sheltered housing complex recently, and we looked outside and could see people in the streets waiting for their drugs to be delivered. And I met a short time back with two sizable local retailers in that area who have had people coming into their premises, either coming in to use drugs eh, or running away from someone else in a related matter. Outside, they have a problem with prostitution, which appears to be linked to the drugs problem as well. One retailer has removed all the benches from outside their store, 
as they were providing a space for people to use drugs. BT were asked to move a phone box, which appeared to be only used for dealing in drugs, eh, but they were not keen to move it. Meanwhile, the police do do their best. However, when they've got a major, eh, recently they got a major, a little while ago, they got a major drug dealer's house closed down and the problem fragmented and scattered so that there were more locations used for selling than there had been previously. The police also tell me that dealers are using drones to get warning of police in the area. So clearly we have a problem. We are not going to solve it only by controlling supply. We also have to tackle demand. Now, one suggestion has been made for safer drug consumption facilities on page 32 eh, of the, the paper, which euphemistically says the drugs would be, quote, obtained elsewhere, unquote. Now, I understand this to mean that the drugs would continue to be bought and sold illegally, but they could be used in a safer, more controlled environment. Now, that does have some merit, I accept that, but I remain ill at ease that a proposed future system should have this criminal element built into it. Another major option, if we're moving to more of a health model, is HAT, or heroin-assisted treatment. And I have to say, I am much more comfortable with that model. If this really is a health issue, then it seems to me better that both the substance to be used and the using of it should be in a controlled health setting. It has to be said that local residents and businesses are not entirely comfortable with HAT either, as has happened uh, with methadone, they are concerned that having such a facility and provision in the area will bring other problems with it. Another aspect is that people addicted to alcohol, drugs or gambling have underlying problems that need to be addressed. And some of them are going to take a considerable length of time to solve. So I'm pleased to see that in the Conservative paper uh, mentioning this on page two, they say there are often are deeper underlying problems and the two examples they give are mental health and family breakdown. But as others have said, there is no mention of poverty. There is no mention of just a general lack of hope that may be the reasons people are seeking to escape into addiction. I do very much welcome the emphasis in a person-centered approach, and it will not be one size fits all. Member members may have heard previously of Calton Athletic Football Club, which was run by Davy Bryce, and they had a specific model for getting young guys heavily into sport. And that had some great successes, but would clearly not be the right model for everyone. There are many other local projects in our area and throughout Glasgow, and I just mentioned a few. Uh, recovery cafes in Shettleston and at Parkhead Nazarene Church, Scottish families affected by alcohol and drugs, Family Addiction Support Service, Alcoholics Anonymous, Al Anon, the Simon Community Turning Point, the Archery Settlement Centre in Bridgeton, and some groups particularly focused on women. The group goes on. The third sector has to be given tremendous plaudits for the work they are doing. So one theme I think is extremely important is that we look at individuals and deliver services that address their specific circumstances. We know from smoking cessation that some people stop instantly, others reduce gradually, while others use a substitute like vaping. So I think we need to assume the same with drugs and other addictions, that we need a variety of options. And I'm slightly wary of the conservative approach which can come across as everyone going down one specified route. However, the Conservative paper Addiction Strategy Life Plan does make some reasonable points, including early intervention, increasing the role of pharmacists and the third sector, all of which I support. But when I read on page three that they want a dramatic increase in rehabilitation services, and on page five, an increase in the number of addicts in treatment, I imagine there might be a cost to this. And it's difficult to see when the Conservatives consider we are too highly taxed already and therefore public services should be reduced, how that can work. Uh, I don't think I've got time, sorry. Uh, Labour also suggests greater priority in preventative action, but again, that means disinvestment somewhere else to pay for the money. So overall, I'm glad the Conservatives have brought this debate today. It's good that we all acknowledge there is a problem and we can openly discuss it. I think rights, respect and recovery looks broadly excellent and I hope we can all agree we have some common ground on this. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Emma Harper to be followed by Brian Whittle. Thank you, President Officer. It's always interesting to be one of the last speakers in the debate and hear the contributions ahead. And so I've got loads of scribbles over my paper as I've made little comments. Uh, as a nurse, I've got experience working with people who require help to address their 
problematic use of alcohol and drugs. And I agree with Tom Arthur that he's mentioned that many of us across chamber will also have direct experience and knowledge of uh, people that have had problem use as well. It's a complex issue requiring a multi-team and key partners and a person-centred patient rights approach. And I welcome the new rights, respect and recovery strategy, which aims to prevent and reduce alcohol and drug use, harm and related death. In today's debate, I'd like to focus on two aspects, social prescribing and safe consumption rooms. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government's alcohol and drug treatment strategy, unlike the succinct uh, proposal by the, the Tories, has a person-centred approach that, so that treatment and support services address people's wider health and social needs, such as mental health, employability and homelessness. In the last 10 years, our understanding of the underlying causes of addiction and substance use disorders has changed and developed. The Scottish Government now recognises that deprivation, poverty, trauma and adverse childhood experiences can cause people to seek alcohol and drugs, which can lead to problematic use. And while there are clear differences between the root causes and the response by services, they have too much in common to be kept apart. Treatment can no longer be clinical, but must also address some of the deep-rooted social and economic circumstances that people face. It is fundamental that we address issues such as social isolation and stigma that others have mentioned, and these remain major barriers to recovery. The Scottish Government's renewed approach, along with the introduction of minimum unit, minimum unit pricing for alcohol, show a range of measures that this SNP government is taking to help people with problem use and that devastates lives and families and communities. I spoke with a former colleague yesterday who's a nurse specialist who supports people experience problem drug and alcohol use and she said anecdotally that the minimum unit pricing is actually working. Her client cohort are consuming less of the high in alcohol drinks that the minimum pricing strategy is targeted at. So I welcome future evidence that's going to be presented by the government when we see the actual numbers or the effects of that policy. Sure, I'll take an intervention. Rachel Hamilton. I thank Emma Harper for taking the intervention. Um, you're talking about the evidence um, that the minimum alcohol pricing will eventually uh, give us as to whether people are dropping their levels of alcohol consumption. Would you also agree that um, with regards to reducing um, drug deaths, there should be clear measurable targets? Emma Harper. I think we're talking about patients' lives here, and I think the ultimate first goal is saving people's lives, the right to life, and the right to support people through any health care problem that they have. And first and foremost, I have said previously in this chamber, we need to stop treating drug users as criminals, and instead we must look at illicit drug use as a public health issue. So it's actually good to see that the, the Tories are finally catching up with the public health issue in their uh, document that they presented. And I welcome that. But unfortunately, in terms of the law and drug policy, as we've heard, we're reliant upon an out-of-touch government to take decisions on our behalf. And I would suggest that the members opposite should lobby um, for powers over drug laws to be devolved to the Scottish Parliament. And I know others have said that it's a UK-wide issue, but the Scottish Government do have a goal to address this. And using laws that are 47 years old really need to be challenged and we need to be addressing this. Would Emma Harper take a brief intervention? Yes, of course. Stuart McMillan. Well, I thank Emma Harper for taking the intervention. Uh, certainly, subject to the, the comments from Michelle Ballantyne earlier regarding having a, a, whole, a whole system mapping strategy, uh, would the devolution of these papers actually help with that? Emma Harper. I would welcome any devolution of any powers, and I think that if we have an idea and a plan to treat people with rights, respect, and it, educate them or help them to support a recovery strategy, I would welcome any devolution of any laws. We have 200 community and residential rehab centres in Scotland, and although these centres can help, there's an average of 70% of people who come out of treatment that revert to problem use within six months. Um, I find these numbers quite challenging, but I 
Earlier this year, I attended and spoke at the opening of the River Garden, which is the Independence from Drugs and Alcohol Recovery Community, which is in Jean Freeman's constituency. So it's interesting to hear that Annie Wells has actually visited that uh, uh, centre. It's a recovery community. Um, Independence from Drugs and Alcohol, or otherwise known as River Garden, they apply a social prescribing approach to recovery. And it applies the San Padrignano, which is an Italian recovery model, in which looks at one of the oldest, longest running, successful residential treatment centres. It's been working for over 39 years and it achieves full recovery for persons with addiction support. I realise time is short and I would support social prescribing issues and I would welcome the Minister's thoughts on supporting these social prescribing models such as the San Padrinano one at River Garden. And um, presiding officer, I would be happy to continue debating on, but I realise time is, uh, is short. So I support the Scottish Government's new strategy and reaffirm the calls from the SNP for powers over drug policy to be devolved so that we can really take action and support our people and save lives. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Brian Whittle to be followed by Alex Neil. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, early on in my time in this place, I asked Ad Action if I could speak to some of their service users as part of my initial uh, preventable health investigation. Let me tell you, Presiding Officer, it was a, a real lesson to me. Do not go into these meetings with any preconceived ideas. I sat facing a horseshoe of service users who shot from the hip and did not miss. But I have to say, I really appreciate that kind of approach. No sugar coating of issues, just straight up brutal reality. And I went back several times uh, and, and when inputting into the Conser Scottish Conservative Drug and Alcohol Strategy, I have tried to keep their words in mind and they're also one of several third sector agencies I spoke to in writing this speech. And I wanted to assure uh, Monica Lennon specifically that, that what I have to say really is, is a list of current issues and asks from them rather than any attempt at me to come up with a speech. So I think there's no use pretending that we understand the issues if you haven't experienced those issues firsthand. I think to just to, 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 to move on from Je what Jenny Mara and John Mason said, I think what is positive about this particular debate is, is both the Scottish Government and, and the Scottish Conservatives have put uh, ideas on the table here to tackle this crisis. And I, I, and I think, are we going to get everything right? Absolutely not. We certainly won't get everything wrong, so let's not dismiss every idea out of hand. So in East Asia is a mixture of towns and rural areas, and it happens to have the biggest rise in drug deaths in Scotland in the last year. And all signs suggest that that trajectory is likely to be repeated this year. So whatever strategy is currently being, being deployed is not working. And those third sector agencies and organisations on the front line have told me they are being swamped, they are being undervalued and under-resourced and not listened to. I'm also told there's a huge rise and cocaine users in the area, and that habit is driving people into debt, especially young men. Not only is their habit directly con contributing to the rise in drug deaths, I am was told that addicts as young as 18 are in hock to drug dealers for as much as £20,000. They are then themselves being coerced into dealing, and with no apparent escape from that black hole, suicide becomes an option in their minds. These are not my words, uh, presenting officer, that is what I was told is the reality. And these are the people, I think, that, that are most likely to fall foul of the law. But these are the people that we, we should really be viewing them as the health issue. What I would say, however, is those that sit behind them, those who are the real dealers, are the ones that feel, should feel the full force of the law. Another issue that arose was that mental health services would not engage with those who are still using. So they are sent to third sector agencies to tackle uh, that addiction. The problem, of course, with this is that addiction agencies are generally not equipped to deal with complex mental health problems. And although they will not turn these cases away, the chances of successful outcomes without mental health interventions alongside the addiction services are much reduced. You see, presiding officer, many of these cases are people who are self-medicating because of previous trauma or poor mental health. And without that multi-agency support for that individual, uh, uh, planned conversion rates are going to be poor. Even for those who make it into the system, they are not getting the ongoing support required to make that full recovery. Addiction services, I am told, are generally generating prescriptions, and all too often that's where the help stop. I met with a woman who had been on methadone for 23 years before she found out it was even possible to come off it. 
Even then, it was only through a chance meeting with someone else who had gone through the process themselves. Uh, I will take an intervention there. Neil Findlay. I, I, I'm, I'm listening very carefully to his speech. It's a very good speech, actually, and very informed. Um, um, I wonder if he agrees that um, putting people back into the criminal justice system, justice system is a backward step and that his approach sounds a much more sensible step. I wonder if he will have a word with his colleagues on that because we should be taking some of the approaches that he's suggesting. Brian Whittle. I thank uh, Mr Finlay uh, for his intervention. I think, I think it, it, in, some, in some respects, I do, uh, of course, we should try and uh, uh, bring them into the, uh, bring it as a health uh, issue. Ine inevitably and eventually, in some cases, there's going to have to be some kind of criminality involved in that. But that is certainly not the first step that should be taken. Um, I was going to say, uh, um, that woman I was talking about there with that peer support has managed to get off of methadone, uh, reignite a relationship with her daughter, and was actually working again. Healthcare professionals can be reluctant, again, I'm told, to reduce medic medication usage when they see those who have managed to come off of drugs and reduce uh, uh, through that medication find some reasonable balance compared to where they were. But that should not be the end of the journey. I think this is where the third sector involvement is so crucial in supporting those in this situation who are reducing their medication dependency in collaboration with medical interventions. I think one of the big asks is around the needle exchange program uh, in East Ayrshire. There are very limited uh, opportunities to, to access this service. Why are pharmacies that are dispensing methadone and other similar medication not equipped for this service? I think the rise in HIV and hepatitis C in Glasgow has been associated with the reduction in the needle exchange programme. Surely it's much more effective to prevent hep C to, than, than, than to treat it, because hep C treatment costs around £10,000, and that is only a further internal uh, damage to organs hasn't already occurred. I see I'm running towards the end of my time. I just wanted to say that, that, that in what I think, and, and there have been many good uh, inputs today, I want to say to Joan McAlpine, I think you have devalued this debate and a feeble attempt to try and blame elsewhere uh, for Scotland's crisis. It doesn't explain why Scotland has a drug and alcohol death rate of two and a half times the rest of the year, the rest, no time, than the, you, didn't, uh, you didn't take my intervention. It, it doesn't explain why Scotland has a drug and alcohol death rate of two and a half times the rest of the UK. We need to stop blaming elsewhere and start taking some responsibility, a uh, presiding officer. Can I just say in conclusion, I think the Scottish Conservatives recognise that each individual situation will be different and will require a different set of solutions, be that in medication, mental health support and social interventions within the NHS and the third sector, and the early access to assessment which allows each individual to be signposted to the appropriate services is essential. Presiding officer. Thank you very much. And before we go to closing speeches, I call Alec Neil. Presiding officer. Can I say, Annie Wales said that we had failed for the last 10 years in relation to dealing with this problem. I disagree with that. I think we have collectively failed for the last 50 years in dealing with this problem. And part of the reason for that is, as Jenny Mara said, is we don't yet actually, after all these years, totally understand all the complexities of what causes the problem and what is the best way to try and solve or at least mitigate the problem. And that's where I think we've all got to come together and learn from each other and listen to every strand of opinion because nobody has a monopoly of the truth in relation to this matter. Many different ways of approaching the problem have been tried, including in the last 10 years, but before that as well, under successive governments in the UK and in the devolved administration. I remember, presiding officer, when I came into this parliament uh, 19 years ago, the first committee I sat on was the Social Justice Committee chaired by Margaret Curran. And the first major inquiry we did was into the problem of drug addiction. And we should go back and look at that, uh, actually, because a lot of what we recommended then has been implemented. Some of what we recommended has not been implemented. But even with recommending all those recommendations, we still have a major problem. And I think the interesting fact is the figures. I think we shouldn't just go by one year. I mean, the statistics are appalling. The number of people who are losing their lives as a result of drug addiction. I don't think any of us would say otherwise. But if you go way back and look as to when figures were started to be recorded, then the trend is continually upwards. Irrespective of who's been in power, 
irrespective of what's been happening elsewhere, the reality is that the numbers have been creeping up and then actually getting to the point where we've reached nearly 1,000 people in a year in terms of deaths. Now, clearly, there is some indication that that may be about to peak because of the age profile. I take the point about not describing these people as aging in the traditional sense, but the age profile does suggest, particularly if you look at the decline in deaths amongst the under 25 year olds, it does suggest that we may have peaked in terms of the deaths, but that is not in any way to minimize the scale of the problem. And I hear many people saying, why is it that Scotland has a, big, a bigger problem than the rest of the United Kingdom? And why is it indeed we appear to have a bigger problem than the rest of Europe? And there I would refer people to the research done by Sir Harry Burns eh, on the biology of poverty and related issues. He has actually studied presiding officer the issue of why, not just in relation to things like uh, uh, drug addiction, but in relation to mental health problems and indeed physical health problems, why, for example, Glasgow's health record has been relatively so much worse than Liverpool's, even although on the face of it, Liverpool suffered the same rundown in industry as Glasgow did over the last 30, 40, 50 years. And if you read Harry Burns' stuff, is very interesting and there are reasons as to why Glasgow in particular, but I will in a minute, Glasgow in particular, but other parts of Scotland as well, have not been uh, so good at tackling these issues or perhaps not had this had a much bigger scale of a problem than these, what you would think would be comparable cities. But there are reasons as to why that has happened. Neil Finlay. Yeah, thanks, and I have read that research, and it's very interesting. But if we look at uh, a country like Portugal, which had worse um, uh, statistics than ours, worse infection rates and deaths, they have turned that round very significantly with a change in policy. Alec Neil. Absolutely. And the change in policy in Portugal is one that we should study and learn from, and not just in Portugal, but in other countries as well. And if I may say so, and I'm not making a constitutional point here, uh, we would require, if we were going to do this, uh, if we didn't have you know, agreement with Westminster to do it across the whole of the UK, if we wanted to do it in Scotland, we would need the powers here to do it. That's not a constitutional point, it's uh, just a practical point. I, I do believe in experimentation. I do believe we need to pilot many more ways of trying to tackle this problem. But in some cases, not in all cases, but in some cases, we need the power to do that. Mr Neil, we'll not get this time back, but uh, Brian Whittle. Mr. Neil, for, for taking the intervention, I wonder whether, whether or not your, your rationale explains why uh, East Ayrshire has the highest rise in, in drug deaths. Uh, 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 Alec Neil, absolutely. Go back and look at that report, the social justice report I referred to in the year 2000. We actually visited Cumnock and we visited Aberdeen as part of our inquiry. When we went to Cumnock, Cumnock has never recovered from the uh, closure of the coal industry. And that destroyed a lot of lives, not just a lot of jobs, it destroyed a lot of uh, lives. And actually, Cumnock is only beginning to recover from that now. When you went to Aberdeen and looked at the so-called drug problem in Aberdeen at that time, there was a complete contrast between the problem in Cumnock, where it was clearly caused by a sense of hopelessness, and in Aberdeen, where the issue was mainly about recrea so-called recreational drug taking. So that's why I say it's complex. The problem in Cumnock and the problem in Aberdeen and the reasons for the problem so were completely different. So I think in all of this, we've got to take a genuine collective approach, try to get independent advice, but let's step on the accelerator because I think we're all agreed this is a problem but we don't want to be here in 10 years discussing it under the same circumstances. Thank you very much. I mean, I move to closing speeches. I call on David Stewart to wind up for the Labour Party. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And I, I believe this has been an excellent, uh, well-informed debate with passionate speeches from across the chamber on new approaches to tackling Scotland's drug crisis. And Miles Briggs, 
um, should be praised for bringing this before Parliament today. Whilst this side of the chamber might not agree with all of his submissions, um, where our minds meet is on the big picture, which is Scotland has a troubled relationship with alcohol and drugs, that this culture is ruining the health and well-being of too many Scots, and the range and scale of Scotland's substance misuse problem cannot be downplayed or forgotten. And I think Jenny Maher should be congratulated for session. We should all be getting our heads together to work out a strategy, and certainly uh, we should be doing that from this side as well. Um, as my colleagues uh, Monica Lennon, Neil Finlay and Jenny Mara made clear in their excellent speeches, the record levels of drug-related deaths are unacceptable and Scottish Labour are calling on the Scottish Government, as others have done today, to face up to the crisis and declare the situation a public health emergency. And as we have identified beside officer and amendment, we call on Sc Scottish Government to have a new strategy to reduce the number of drug-related deaths by 50%. This is very much in line, as the Minister knows, with the World Health Organisation global status report and reduce the levels of alcohol consumption by at least 10% over the next 10 years. But, President Officer, there's the ghost to every feast in this debate, and that is health inequality. Now, many members, like uh, Alec Neil and Brian Whittle, mentioned the spectre, and members will know that the National Burden of Diseases report in 2016 made it clear that drug use and alcohol dependency are major contributors to health inequality. And Members again will know that disadvantaged areas have double the rate of illness and early death in richer areas. And in, most, in our most deprived areas, uh, drug use disorders were the leading cause of disease in residents 15, aged 15 to 44. Now, some members rightly attended to look at the future in drug use, and they looked at issues that are coming on the horizon now we should be concerned about, like new psychoactive substances, prescribed medication. And if you want any lessons about the way forward, look at America and the horrors of the opiate crisis. And I was reading recently when I was over there that 90% um, of people injecting heroin started with ordinary uh, prescriptions for opiates. It's a very frightening model. Obviously, there's other developments in the future, the image and performance enhancing drugs, online supply, and members also have mentioned uh, bloodborne virus transmissions. Now, in alcohol, presiding officer, I think we do know the right direction, uh, and I would concede this to government. I do believe that the quantity discount ban, irresponsible alcohol proportion ban are very sensible, and I also do believe on the minimum unit pricing implementation, but I would ask a very specific point to give notice, uh, I'm almost fair about that, to the Minister. The Minister will know when we discuss this that the, the Sheffield modelling around MUP estimated a windfall of around £40 million a year to the alcohol industry. Now, when will the Scottish Government introduce the regulations to en enact the social responsibility levy, which has been passed by Parliament, and this could provide the funding uh, to tackle alcohol abuse to hard-pushed health services or indeed as well to our third sector or organisations um, across Scotland. And the very brief time I've got available, could I just summarise some of the points in the debate? I, I think Miles Briggs was, was right to talk about the scale of drug abuse. It's a staggering figure, 3.5 billion. Uh, absolutely phenomenal. I also agree with them that we do need to look at cross-portfolio work um, and uh, looking at an in, uh, his view as an independent view of uh, methadone. But he also used the point about public health emergency. And obviously my, my colleague, uh, Monica Lennon, I think made uh, quite frightening statistics when she talked about the 15,000 uh, substance abuse deaths over the last 10 years, which she mentioned to a small town. But I also believe that our points about stigma were well made. Uh, and also many members, uh, including from this side, mentioned the importance of the safe uh, consumption facilities in Glasgow and that that's something that we and I think our amendment be clear that we are uh, we strongly support um, Alison Johnston has always made a very well informed um, speech and again she emphasized the point um, about overarching strategy prevention being the key but one of the key points that came out of her speech was that there's a 200 percent increase in drug deaths among women uh, Alec Cole Hamilton um, uh, made a very thoughtful speech um, his particular point that, that jumped out to me was the 23% cut in ADP funding and his also point about the fetal outcome uh, spectrum disorder, which I think was very innovative and that was an extremely good point. Um, Liam Kerr made some very good points, particularly around having the innovative approach and his points on the Commission. And John, John McAlpine, I think, had a, a very uh, useful quote when she said that we can't arrest or punish away 
um, out of sorry, that, there you are, out of uh, Scotland's uh, drug problems. I think that was a very, very good um, quote. I was very impressed with Neil Finlay's very powerful speech. Uh, who's got a, he's got a great knowledge in this area, uh, talking about people being the collateral damage, uh, the enhancement of the criminal network that happens, the fact that streets are awash with cannabis and cocaine, and that last place you need to be when you have an addiction of any sort um, is on prison. Very conscious of time, presiding officer. So moving very quickly to the conclusion, um, could I thank the Minister for publishing the new alcohol and drug use strategy this morning. Um, I welcome the Scottish Government's move towards recovery oriented care. Um, and I also would touch on the points that some members have made that we should we kind of normalise this because every member in this chamber, including members themselves, will know someone who's dealing with an addiction challenge. It's something that touches so many lives and so many people are suffering from addiction. And in conclusion, um, presiding officer, I was very struck by a quote that I discovered this morning from a recovering addict who's well known probably to everyone, uh, and that is Russell Brand. And he said, and I quote, the mentality and behavior of drug addicts and alcoholics is wholly irrational until you understand they are completely powerless over their addiction. And unless they have structured help, they have no hope. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. I call Joe Fitzpatrick to wind up for the Scottish Government. Thank you. Um, I, I welcome um, the range of views that we've heard today from across the chamber. I actually do think it's been quite a good debate. I know there was a little bit where maybe we were all a bit heated and that, that's never good, particularly when you're talking about a subject like this. But I think in the main, um, it's been um, a good debate. It clearly captures just how emotive and important this issue is to people in the chamber, um, as much as it is to the people in communities right across Scotland. But obviously, despite the many different opinions here today, I know that we all agree on the fact that we all want to see a reduction in the levels of harm associated with alcohol. The points raised have also highlighted just um, some of the complexities that we see in this area. As a country, we, we, we face these complex complexities in trying to tackle the many and varied challenges associated with high-risk drug and alcohol use. Um, I'm going to try, uh, we're quite short for time, so I'll try and cover as many of the, the, the points that were raised. Um, there was, I think Miles Briggs and Monica Lennon and a few other people um, talked about the call for a, to support a public health emergency. I'll probably take a second just to say where that came from. So that originated um, from, I think, really um, uh, the British Columbia, where the provincial government um, called, a, called a, a public health emergency, which then resulted in the... Uh, federal government having to take actions and there it was very much around the, the, the issues that we're looking at in terms of safe, safer consumption spaces which they, they needed the support to do. If I could stand here and declare a public health emergency and that would make the UK government change the, the drug laws to allow Glasgow to proceed with the safer consumption spaces uh, space um, which we know would save lives, then I would do that. But unfortunately, there is no meaning to the phrase in Scotland. However, I absolutely accept and recognise um, that, that, that the levels of death is a public health priority. It is absolutely unacceptable. Every one of these deaths is avoidable and we need to work together to, to, to do that. Yes. I'm, I'm grateful to the Minister for giving way. Um, I, I can't think of a word other than emergency. And the reason why we've asked for this in our amendment is so that the full force of government can act. It's not about blaming the government. As we've heard from other members, the issue around ADPs and the structures around that, it's not all about money. It's about the governance and the transparency and the accountabilities to our communities. We can't afford for more people to die. It's not a slogan, it's a genuine attempt to make sure that every part of government, local government, public spend, everything is completely focused. And I can assure the Minister and, and give his front bench our Succinctly, commitment please, Ms. that if, 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 if that declaration is made, then he will have our full support. So it is absolutely about making this the, the full force of government to address this um, public public health priority, and that is that is what we need to do. I, I think I better make some progress because there was a number of points made through 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 the the debate. Um, so Monica Lennon, um, sorry, I mixed up my my points. 
sorry, there was some, some talk um, early on in the debate, I don't know if it was Mr Briggs or during, it was during Monica Lennon's debate, um, criticising the Labour Party for not having brought forward a strategy. But I want to put on record that when I published a draft strategy, it was about consulting with everybody, everybody in, in, in all, the, all the spokespeople I, sh I shared that with, I sh and we shared it with stakeholders across Scotland. And I can confirm that um, Monica Lennon was one of the people who came back to us with um, issues um, which we have addressed as part of the strategy. So this strategy is not my strategy. This strategy is Scotland's strategy. It's been built. It's been pulled together with input from stakeholders across Scotland, including members in, in this chamber. I thank the Minister for taking uh, this intervention. You know, what today's debate has shown that the government strategy, which has been published today, can be improved, that we have brought ideas. Two specific ones I would like to see is a review of all drug-related deaths in Scotland and for targets to actually be attached to the strategy. They're not in the current format. We want them to be. Will you do a cross-party support to make sure that happens? Yes. So the strategy, um, as published this morning, um, specifically includes a section in terms of evaluation and review. And I think that is really important because it's, it's not just about having the strategy, it's about making sure that it works. Um, I, I thought very carefully about targets, and this maybe comes to, to Dave Stewart, Stewart's um, point, um, when I think he, he, he suggested that the, the two targets in the Labour motion were targets of the World Health Organization. So that, that's not exactly true. The first target is not in terms of drug deaths. The second target in terms of alcohol is, and I think that's a reasonable point that we should look at. I feel very uncomfortable at setting the targets of the number of people that we would say is acceptable to die because my, my view is that every single one of these is unacceptable and we need, I, 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 there's a number of points, I need, I need to make progress. I, I, have, I've, I've thought, I just, I feel very uncomfortable because every one of these deaths is avoidable. So we need, to, if we can work together to do what we can to, 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 to work on this issue together, then I think that's, I mean, it would be so easy for me to say, I'm, I'm gonna use a target that in 10 years time, there'll be no deaths, but um, I, I, I really care about this. And so I, I'm just, I'm concerned that it would, it would not send the right message, but I understand, I understand the points and why people are asking for that very quickly, because otherwise I'm not gonna make. Jenny Mara. If the Minister could outline how we're going to work together, I think I suggested in my speech that I think we would all be prepared to come together in a cross-party way on this emergency. Can you outline exactly how that will work, please? Jovis Bashir. So there's already been a, a, a large degree of um, collaboration in terms of getting to this point. There's further documents in terms of our delivery strategy. So if people have, have ideas about things that we should include in the delivery strategy going forward. We'll obviously be working with stakeholders across Scotland in terms of those who provide um, the services. But if people have, no, I have to make, I have to make progress. If people have, have, have suggestions on how we can do that, then I'm happy to sit down and, and have those discussions because this really does matter. And um, you know, there's some, some really important issues that were talked about through the day. I wanna to touch very quickly on um, Neil Finlay mentioned the, the, um, the changes that were made in Portugal, and I, I think there, there are definitely lessons that we can make there, but we actually, we, we would have to either have a UK government which was prepared to see um, um, drug and alcohol abuse in a, in a public health context, or else for, to give this parliament those powers. I, I, I met with my, my opposite number in Westminster recently, and, and I, I was really disappointed that the, the, the minister there could not see this in a public health context. She was only able to see this in as a justice context. I think I need to finish um, by reiterating my earlier point, that improving, that improving how we support people affected by drugs and alcohol requires a concerted approach, not just by those in alcohol and drug services or those in wider health and social care services, but by people, services and organisations across the whole of society. My challenge to this chamber today, therefore, is to give your support to this new strategy. Give this approach, your support to this new approach, an approach that places health and person-centred services at the heart of the treatment of the harms from drugs and alcohol that cause misery to so many people across Scotland. Thank you, and I call Adam Tonkins to conclude their debate. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm, I'm very proud that we've talked about this issue in Conservative Party time this afternoon. The debate, as the Minister just said, has been heated at times, but in my view, um, genuinely valuable and constructive contributions have been made from members right across the chamber, and I'd like to thank everybody who's taken part in this afternoon's debate. Often in politics, Presiding Officer, you have to speak about issues that you wish you knew a little bit more about, but not this afternoon.
Presiding Officer. Today's proceedings have been peppered with speeches in which members from across the Chamber have, plain, uh, have plainly wished that they did not really know as much about the issue as they do, about the death, about the pain and the destruction that drug and alcohol addiction continues to cause every day here in Scotland. This is an area where none of us has all of the answers, but where all of us have something useful uh, to say. The starting point, it seems to me, presiding officer, has to be with an honest and robust appraisal of the road to recovery approach that was set out a decade ago. A decade ago, or a little more than a decade ago, in 2007, there were 52,000 problem drug users in Scotland. There are now 61,500 problem drug users in Scotland. In 2007, there were 455 drug-related deaths in Scotland. This number now rises to nearly 1,000. This is two and a half times the UK average. It's the worst in Europe, presiding officer. And methadone is present, is present in nearly half of these deaths. Now, the word crisis is often overused uh, in politics, but this is a crisis. It is a public health emergency. And we must, presiding officer, we must be honest about the failure of the policy that has led us to this point, and we must be robust about the remedies that we need to move on from here. As Monica Lennon said in her opening speech earlier this afternoon, and I agree with her, it's not just a refresh of the policy that is required. And as Alec Neil said in his speech a few moments ago, these statistics are appalling, and we should be appalled by them, notwithstanding the fact that they are so often uh, tragically repeated. And as Alec Cole Hamilton said, the cut, the ongoing cut in um, uh, alcohol and drug partnership funding, most recently of one and a half million from 2016-17 to 2017-18, despite record drug deaths, does not exactly help, does it? So, presenting officer, what would we do? Well, we sought to set out uh, earlier this week our strategy for beginning to tackle uh, some of these problems. And our strategy, I think, starts by recognizing that drugs policy needs to tackle addiction at source and needs to dig deep and understand that relationship between addiction and mental health, family breakdown, and adverse childhood experience. And if that's what a public health approach to drugs policy means, then I fully support it. But I have to say, presiding officer, I do reject the false antithesis that we have to somehow choose that drugs policy is either a public health issue or a criminal justice issue. We cannot afford to ignore the role that the criminal justice system must play in this system when, as John Scott pointed out in an intervention, some 90% of offenders arriving at jail in Scotland come with addiction problems. And that's why, one second, Minister, that's why um, uh, our opening proposal uh, in our strategy published this week is for a pilot on local commissions that seeks to address precisely this point. We need a holistic approach to addiction policy that joins up public health and criminal justice elements of it. Happy to give away to the Minister. Joe Fitzpatrick. You mentioned um, justice and public health um, approaches. Will the member accept that a policy which will save lives, like the safer consumption space, is a public health approach which should be supported and will he call on, on his colleagues at Westminster to either allow us to do that by changing the law at Westminster or giving us the powers to do so? And could I ask colleagues just to keep the conversations down please? Adam Tompkins. Um, no, um, I want to get people off drugs, not make it easier for people to take them. It's a step down the road to decriminalisation and it's a step in completely the wrong direction and that's why I will not support it, not for Glasgow nor for any other city. Uh, in Scotland. The second proposal that we're making in our strategy published this week, uh, presiding officer, is that there needs to be an urgent and fully independent review of methadone in Scotland. 8,000 drug users in Scotland have been on methadone for more than five years. And methadone was present in nearly half of all drug-related deaths in Scotland last year. So whatever it is that's happening across Scotland with regard to methadone is not working. Keeping people on a drug substitute does not help them beat their addiction. Substituting prescription drugs like methadone for illicit drugs does not deal with the problem, presiding officer. It merely delays the problem. The third proposal that we're making in our strategy published this week is that there must be a redirection of funds into rehabilitation, recovery 
and abstinence. As Jenny Mara said twice during the uh, afternoon's debate, it's not all about money. Of course, money is important, but it's not all about money. It's about how you spend it. And we need to see a dramatic increase in rehab services to deliver additional capacity uh, and placements. And I would, I would like to say um, on a point of, for me, consensus, that it, it, to this regard, I welcome um, the comments that are made in the Scottish Government's uh, strategy published uh, earlier this morning. Unlike the draft, which was circulated a few weeks ago, the document published today does talk, and does talk honestly about the importance of recovery. It says this, and I quote from the Scottish Government's document, recovery is clearly a journey for people away from the harm and the problems which they experience towards a healthier and more fulfilling life. In this context, we need to continue to develop recovery-oriented systems of care across Scotland. I welcome that, and I think it's very important, but I would want to push the Minister a little bit further in terms of explaining exactly what policies contained in this document or anywhere else um, are going to be used by the Scottish Government to deliver on these aspirations. It's all rather lofty, it's pointing in the right direction, but we need concrete action, and we need concrete action on this now. And that's the final point I want to make about the strategy that we published uh, this week, presiding officer. Our strategy says that it should be measured against two clear, ambitious, but realizable targets. First, that within five years, we will halve the number of drug deaths in Scotland. And second, that we will increase the number of problem drug users accessing treatment from 40%, which is where it is in Scotland at the moment, to 60%, which is where it is elsewhere in the United Kingdom. The draft drugs strategy that the Scottish Government circulated in September showed a startling lack of ambition for people with uh, uh, addiction. Rather than helping people move beyond their addiction, it focused only on managing addiction, perpetuating what is for some a disastrous state-sponsored dependency that can last years, even decades. Presiding officer, drug users don't need a drugs plan to help them manage their addiction. They need a life plan to help them end their addiction. Every problem drug user can be brought off drugs and supported back into a functioning lifestyle. That's the standard against which any drugs or addiction strategy should be measured. The Scottish Government strategy published today is an improvement on the draft published a few months ago, but work remains yet to be done to make it truly fit for purpose. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on a new approach needed to tackle Scotland's drug crisis. The next item is a consideration of business motion 14958 in the name of Graham Day. On behalf of the Bureau, can I call on Graham Day to move the motion? Move, presiding officer. Thank you very much. No one wishes to speak against the motion or on the motion. The question is that motion 14958 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The next item is consideration of business motion 14959 in the name of Graham Day. And this is on the timetable of a bill at stage two. Uh, can I call on Graham Day to move the motion? Move, presiding officer. Thank you. No one wishes to speak against the motion. The question, therefore, is that motion 14959 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item is consideration of two parliamentary bureau motions. Could I ask Graham Day, on behalf of the bureau, to move motions 14960 on the size of a committee and 14981 on committee meeting times? Move, presiding officer. Thank you very much. We come to decision time. Can I remind members that if the amendment in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick is agreed, then the amendment in the name of Monica Lennon will fall. The first question is that amendment 14914.2 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, which seeks to amend motion 14914 in the name of Miles Briggs, on a new approach needed to tackle Scotland's drugs crisis, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 14914.2 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick is yes, 85, no, 32. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. 
The amendment in the name of Monica Lennon therefore falls. And the next question is that motion 14914 in the name of Miles Briggs as amended uh, on a new approach needed to tackle Scotland's drugs crisis be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 14914 in the name of Miles Briggs as amended is yes 89, no 28. There were no abstentions and the motion as amended is therefore agreed. The next question is that motion 14960 in the name of Graham D on the size of a committee be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. The final question is that motion 14981 in the name of Graham D on committee meeting times be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you very much. That concludes decision time. We'll move now to members, or shortly, to members' business in the name of Sandra White on planned Bank of Scotland bank closures. We'll just take a few moments for members and ministers to change seats.